Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of my podcast and show. I have a special guest for you today. So let me just jump right into it, go through my normal spiel, get ready and bring him on. Welcome to Break the Cycle with DSD. I am your host, Dwayne. I am not a therapist, nor am I an attorney. I'm an individual much like you that's been through a d- tough, rough experience and developed some tips and techniques that I share with you to help you get your life back, minimize the effect of a toxic high conflict X, repair the relationship with your kids, and basically just get some stability back into your life. Remember, only a licensed professional can diagnose somebody with a personality disorder. So obviously learn about the pattern, the patterns of behavior, but do not, do not, please, please, please do not go around telling everyone that you have diagnosed your ex with a personality disorder and you know. When you do that, you risk your credibility, and that is the one thing that you have in this fight, and you do not want to squander it just on the off chance that you can expose your ex. Just don't do it. It's not worth it. If you like what's going on here and you want to support the channel, you can do that by becoming a channel member. Just scroll on down, hit the join button, and when you do, you get special badges, custom emojis, your name listed in the credits, access to member-only events, and a special member-only Discord that we can all hang out with and share information on. If you want to get notified when these shows go live, and there should have been one that just went out recently, you can text DSD Live one word to 844-598-0012, and that will get you on the SMS notification. So when some weird out of cycle thing happens, like this live stream or a premiere, you'll know about it and be able to join. The phone lines will be open today later after we talk a little bit to the guests, but if you want to dial in, you can do that by dialing 1424-373-5483, 1424-DSD-LIVE, and if you are outside of the United States and you want to participate, you can scroll down in the video description and click that web link and use your computer and or your mobile device to be able to access the show. The one thing I do ask is this show is going to be with Eric Carroll talking about the John Mass situation. So the questions need to be specific to that. Uh, you can also in the chat, just do at DSD. It'll tag me, put question. If you have a question for either of us as we're going through this and uh, on that, let me bring in my special guest, Eric Carroll from dad talk today. Eric, how are you doing today, man? Dwayne, what's going on, man? I'm doing yeah. good. <laughs> you, sir, are a beast that have been just going 9,000 miles an hour. I, I, I look at what you do and I just go, holy crap, how does that guy function and do all the things that he's doing? So I just want to say that as we start out that uh, let me pull, let me do this real quick. If you guys are not familiar, uh, let me click over here. Eric runs. Actually, I'll tell you what, I'm going to pull this up. And why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself for, for the few people who might not know who you are. So who, who are you, Eric? So I, I, I'm a father that uh, I've been through a lot of the same situations, parental alienation. I know what the battle is like in family court. Um, I started the podcast Dad Talk Today about two years ago. I, I'll be honest with you guys. When I started it, I was going to talk about several different topics, but my main focus was on parental alienation because I didn't feel like enough people knew what that was. Uh, so I was going to switch it up because I didn't think we had the audience uh, just to do it on parental alienation. I was shocked. By the time we did our first show, there was 10,000 followers, and I knew then something was something was up. This was more common than I could have ever imagined. Uh, so we, we started doing this show, trying to raise awareness, started getting involved in the political arena, trying to educate our legislators and anybody that would give it time. I, I feel like part of the reason we're going through what we're going through is there's not enough awareness and there's a lot of money driving it. Um, yeah. So I, I want to get that word out there. But uh, it's it's been quite a ride over the past two years and uh, there's a lot going on. Yeah, and just uh, I, I had up on the screen, um, Eric has a dad talk today. Facebook uh, group that's ginormous. So that's he has a lot of content there. Let me pull this back up. And he also, and we're going to be talking about this in a moment. I, the I stand with John documentary that he's doing, but but uh, he's got a YouTube channel. Oh wow, you're growing, man! A YouTube channel. He's focusing more time on that. So guys, please, if you have not yet done that, scroll on over and subscribe to his YouTube channel. Follow him on Facebook, and uh, so. What we'll do now is I just want to jump in. I mean, I have this up on the screen right now. So a lot of people probably don't know the John Mast story. And can you give a little bit of what exactly this I Stand With John movement that you've basically created and have spearheaded, 
what exactly it's about and what's going on with this documentary. Yeah, I'll try to give you, you know, a condensed down version. You know, uh, when I first started this, I wasn't familiar with false allegations. I'll be honest with you guys. I started having a lot of fathers that were reaching out saying that they had had the silver bullet against them in court. Not being familiar with it, I, I tried to kind of keep my distance, to be honest with you at first, because it's like, man, if somebody actually did something like this, I'd never be able to forgive myself. Oh, I started, yeah. again, finding out how common this trick is played in uh, family court, because the second they accuse you of physical abuse, sexual abuse, you're looked at as guilty until proven innocent. And even if you can prove your innocence, many times you're still looked at as guilty. You're always going to have that stigma, that black cloud over your head. So I started hitting these issues a little bit more. Uh, John Mass was a father that had been watching the show. He had reached out to me a few times. He was different than everybody else. Usually people would write in asking for solutions, needing help. John would write me just to tell me to take care of myself. Uh, he was going through his personal situation, but you could just tell he was a, he was a lovable guy. Um, back in 2017, he had been married for eight years, never faced any allegations, a model husband. Uh, his ex claimed that he beat her when they was at a restaurant and uh, made this allegation towards him. The following month, she took out an ex parte protection order against him and the kids saying that he can't come anywhere around. I think John got fed up and he filed for a divorce the next month. One month after filing for divorce, John was accused of sexually molesting his son and his daughter one month after filing for divorce. Uh, that made this whole thing, you know, go into a tailspin and went through three years of parental alienation, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in the family courts. Uh, finally, uh, I'll give you this because this this is the part that ticks me off. John got the video um, from the restaurant that day where they, you know, his ex had said that he had beat her and he took it to the court and said, judge, look for yourself. I mean, this this t shows you everything you need to know. Now that a judge allegedly said, hey, we don't have anything to play that with. I'm, I'm not letting it in the court today. So John was guilty. Uh, fast forward a little bit of time later when it went to family court, there was a new judge that came on the case and said, uh, let's watch this video. What did it show? What John had been telling him all along. He didn't get anywhere near her. So he was exonerated of that charge, and then it brought in to question everything else the mom had said. John won temporary custody at that point, and this was when he was in North Dakota. So once he won custody, mom got the kids and fled to Idaho. Um, because she went across state lines, he had to start it all over again. Uh, he made that trip over there, and he was hoping he was going to get to see his kids. He came back on on Thanksgiving um, knowing that he had been exonerated and was hopefully going to get to see his kids this past February when he showed up to the parking lot being told that he could get his kids. Um, somebody pulled up in a car and pulled up in his ex-wife's car. So he thought it was her. It was not her. It was her father who got out of the car and shot him three times and murdered him. Uh, not but a few minutes after that, as John's laying on the ground uh, struggling to breathe and fighting for his life, the kids pulled up in the parking lot with the mom. And John died. And that's that's why we're doing this, because, you know, and instantly I it's weird. Sometimes things just come to you instantly. I thought of I stand with John because yeah. I knew that as a movement, if we didn't get behind it right then uh, because of this silver bullet and how deadly and dangerous it is. Um, that if we didn't get John's story out, they was going to try to paint this father as a hero. Uh, he took a pedophile off of the yeah. streets. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He took a father off the streets that had proved his innocence. And that's the uh, that's the importance of making sure we get this out there and show people how common this is. Because I can't imagine what it would be like to go through those false allegations, Dwayne. I mean, it's um, it's horrible. I mean, it, yeah. And, and the sad part is, I mean, I've I've had um, some coaching clients who've dealt with this. You know, once it's out there, even if you're exonerated, there's always the people who aren't going to know, right? I mean, like, I would imagine if you and I ran into somebody and, and there was an so you know, not a, not a friend, not somebody we really knew, but if you know Bill on the other, you know, is if someone says, "Hey, Bill is maybe accused of this," are you going to risk it, right? I mean, it's like you know, I mean, if you know, I'm like you and I are friends. If something happened, I know it's BS. That's one thing. But if I didn't know you and you were just kind of a cursory thing, I wouldn't spend any extra time. I mean, it's like there is just a cascade effect of horribleness associated with these types of false allegations. You know, there is, you know, and that again, that's the deadly part of it. The dangerous yeah. thing. I mean, once somebody is accused of that, you 
instantly want to jump to the defense of the person that's making the accusation. And uh, it's being used so commonly now. I, and, you know, I think the tides are starting to turn. The, the legislators are really starting to listen to that even more than they do with equal shared parenting, because a lot of them are facing the allegations, too, because politics is dirty. So there was a bill that was passed in Iowa earlier this year. Uh, after we went to the Capitol, we interviewed some of the legislators, Representative Andrew get, Andrews got a bill in there that protects against false allegations. Nice. Uh, if you make a false accusation and we can prove that it was a false accusation, there's going to be some jail time. There's going to be some punishment and there's supposed to be anyway, but we know rarely is it ever punished if somebody makes those accusations. Well, I think part of the problem is, or part of the, the reality of it is, is that people can hide behind, well, I'm not sure, right? It's like, oh, well, something happened and my child said something. So I'm just, I'm just erring on the side of caution. And, and it seems like for the most part, that's kind of what the, the way they're able to, to swarm their way through it. And it's just horrible. You know, it I mean, is. I mean, and then you take like the story with John. I mean, I think you said, what was it? Almost two, or like close to three years where he hadn't seen his kids playing this game, just trying to fight through the system. Three years. There was a couple of times in between there that he got to see the kids. Uh, you know, during that period, he had sent them gifts on their birthday and on holidays. Yeah, she sent them. She sent them back. So the kids thought that he never reached out on the holidays or anything. There's a video that's on John's profile of him giving the kids the gifts when he finally saw them and said, "See, I told you I sent these to you, uh, but they got sent back to me." That is abuse. That is yeah, so oh, abusive, not just to the kids, but to the parents. I think sometimes it's easy to say, ah, this isn't about the parents, it's about the kids. And for the most part, I agree. But no parent should have to go through situations like John went through, have to spend this money. Yeah. Ultimately, I mean, he lost his life fighting for his children. And uh, it's very real. We're starting to get more and more cases like that, Dwayne. I've, uh, I've no, had I've, so many people yeah. that's reached out saying I'm the next John Mass since this happened, you know. Well, and I think I, I, I'm, I, you had posted a couple of things on your Facebook about two other incidents that had happened. I remember when I saw one, I was like, wait a minute, it, this is, is this another one? You know, is this like a third yeah. one? So like in a two day period, there were two, right? If I remember correctly. Two day period in the same city, in the same oh, wow. city. I didn't when somebody went, yeah. When wow. a father went to pick up his kids at a custody exchange, mom's boyfriend, uh, shot the father. Uh, I think one of them died. Uh, and the other one. He made it, but he was shot in the face. I have no idea how he made that, but there was three. There was three shootings in one week at custody exchanges. It's getting out of hand. Well, and see, you know, and this kind of goes with what you were talking about, why you wanted to do this whole I stand with John and, and get the story out there. Because the the problem when people make these false allegations, you know, and I'm, I'm sure they know in the back of their mind that they're lying and they're just doing it for effect or they're way exaggerating an, an event to try to really just, you know, prove their point. But there's people out there who will believe it and then think that they are saving, you know, it's like, well, I'll sacrifice myself to save these children from this horrible thing. I mean, and it's all predicated on an effing lie. I mean, it's just, it's just horrible. No matter how much you can prove your innocence, there is always going to be people that believe it. You know, John, John right yeah. off said, uh, give me a polygraph test. I want a polygraph test. They did that, passed it with flying colors. He did something called a psychosexual assessment test, which tests for pedophilia yeah. tendencies and stuff. Not only did he pass, he passed with one of the lowest scores they had ever seen. Um, you couldn't have made it towards a more unbelievable person. And then, you know, one of my crew members here on Dad Talk, uh, Robert Garza, has been one of the best friends I could ever ask for. He's really the one that kind of opened my mind and made me start looking into this further. He faced 43 CPS allegations, 43. He beat off every single one. Uh, wow. His case went on for right at 12 years. He spent $600,000 fighting these allegations. But let's be honest, the family courts love that. It's conflict. It keeps that that money racket going. You got to get all these professionals on in there. And I think they're all in each other's back pockets. Yeah. So cases like that, um, I, I think the courts really do encourage it. If we had some type of equality, you'd take that competition and that, that you know, contentious um, spirit out of it, fighting over the kids, the house, the money. Yeah. Um, Let's just, let's just be parents to our kids. Well, and then, I mean, and then the problem is, is you play these games and you temporarily win 
and now you don't have access to your child, then, then effectively the abuser has 100% control of the story. And then like you were talking about, they can play the game where it's like, I don't, I mean, they, I would imagine a lot of times they're not even telling the kids, Hey, the court is saying your mom or your dad can't come see you. It's more like, well, I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why they won't, why he won't call you. I don't, you know, I, I don't yeah. know why he didn't send you a birthday card or a Christmas card. And you know, the poor kids are just living in this nightmare themselves where they think that they've been rejected by a parent, but they can't have right. access to them. And God forbid, if you're, if you, uh, are under a protective order and you violate it, even if, you know, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a messed up thing. It needs to be to where 50, 50, you start out and then you have to fight tooth and nail to lower the time so that that way you have reoccurring access to your kids. You have the ability to maintain that relationship because that's really the key on how to, to stop parental alienation. I think so. And you know, the thing is Dwayne, when, when I've, when I started this and I started getting in the stories, um, I thought maybe everybody's was really different. And to some degree it is. You change the names, you change the faces. When we're talking about alienation, it's the same tricks that are played. I have people that reach out like, you've never heard a story like mine. I've heard it 10 times to date. Um, it's the same thing over and over. And if they were they're educated on this in the courts. You can see it for, from a mile away. A uh, parental alienation, it, the only place for an alienator when it comes to the kid is they use it as a weapon. Um, they're yeah. not just doing this to keep you out of the child's life. They want character assassination. Oh, yeah. um, they're going to they're gonna put down everything about you, you as a person, you as a oh, parent. Yeah. There is no good that you do at all. Somebody that you could have been in a relationship with 10 or 20 years, all of a sudden, you're just the lowest scum bucket on the face of this earth. And they will go to nothing, you know, every to length destroy. Yeah, every to length. completely destroy you. It's just Well, and then sad. the flip side to it is when you were talking about, I mean, if, you, if you're with in a relationship with somebody for, you know, a decade, two decades, they now have two decades worth of private, you know, privileged information that they will take out of context to try to destroy you, to try to, to ultimately win. It's yeah. always taken out of context. They'll post the text messages and stuff and they'll, they'll get the certain little scenes so they can paint their little narrative, you know, after what really happened. You know, the scary part about that from what I've noticed, most of this is the common scenario that I've seen. Once they say the stuff that they do, they believe it. I mean, we're talking yep. about extreme mental health problems here. Oh yeah. Um, Absolutely. And when, when talking about equal shared parenting, I haven't found a way to get it in there yet, but I'd like to see some way that the courts could step in and let's get mom help. Let's get dad help. If there's an alienator out there, let's find out what is making them this way, because I do believe both parents are best. The scary oh, thing about, you know, man. the scary thing about shared parenting, you know, any time with an alienator is dangerous. It doesn't take much to really get in there and completely poison this child's head and, uh, if the courts were doing what they was actually supposed to be doing, I think they'd be spotting so much more of this. Um, I'd say there's more cases with alienation now than there's not from what I've seen. Well, yeah, I think, but I mean, we're kind of in a unique situation because both of us have with our channels and, and what we're doing, draw people who are, who are living this. I, I, right. I don't necessarily think it's as prevalent. I mean, I think it's not as Cause I'll get comments from people. It's like, well, it's not everybody. And I'm like, you're right. Not everybody you acts know? like this. Not everybody plays this game. Not everybody tries to go the restraining order route or plays the you're an abusive person or whatever, you know, but the problem is, is the percentages that do. And I think Eric, you made a great point that, I mean, once you start doing this and you start hearing the stories, it is so common, you know, people, I mean, I don't know how many talk you said, I get all the time where people go, Oh my God, mine is the worst. And, and I listen to their story and I'm, I'm thinking in my head, Nope. Yours isn't the worst. Pretty you know, tame. It's, it's bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's bad. Don't get me wrong, but you know, it's, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think one of the benefits to with what we're doing though, is people realize they're not alone. They're not living in the twilight zone that nobody else has ever experienced this. I mean, I wish it was the case that no one experienced this. Right. And you know, that's it. When you're going through this, you feel isolated, like nobody understands what you're going yep. through. John Mass is a perfect example. Oh, yeah. uh, he had 11 siblings. Guys, when I tell you he had the most beautiful family I've ever met in my life, you'll see. They grew up Amish until 2004. And then uh, they broke away from that. 
But the most forgiving, they're even on screen saying we forgive the murderer. And this was right after it happened. I mean, they just have a heart of gold. I couldn't do that. I I'll be honest with you. I'd be all in my anger, but that was just their nature. But we asked them, you know, did you understand what John was going through? Even though they was there for him every step of the way, they didn't understand what he was going through. And John even admitted sometimes he just felt like nobody understood what he was going through and Most talking about that don't. with yeah, talking about that with alienation, you know, when I, I think mental health is behind most of those cases, but the family courts, the winner take all scenario, I believe is encouraging alienation Absolutely. Of, outside of the mental health arena. It's the, yeah. there's, there's cases where it's just because of the family courts and the competition. Yeah. I got to win that you're seeing some of these cases that are going this way, where if that equality was in there and we encouraged mom and dad to come together, yeah. let's do it on our own. That, the two divorces I went through, um, me and my daughter's mom, I got 50, 50 custody with, well, I just went with her last year and sat down in a Burger King and we hashed it out between ourselves. You couldn't have asked for a better scenario than that. And I wish there was more of that guys. If, if you're going through these issues, maybe there's somebody that's doing this right now. I encourage you do everything you can to keep it out of the courts. Cause once it goes there, the only thing that matters is money. They're going to be looking for a winner. Well, and, and the problem is that if somebody is a little off, so to speak, then there's, they're, they're laser like focused on your destruction and winning, you know, but a normal human, like you were talking about with your ex, you know, yeah, you might start out being angry and and trying to lash out, but, but at a point you realize it's, it's silly. You have this child together you know, let's just figure it out so that it doesn't turn into a complete nightmare. Right. And and I would imagine, I mean, I I only have the one situation, so I haven't had like, I mean, some, some folks like you where you have, you know, one example that's good. And then the next example is horrific because I mean, you have another situation that's not great. And it's, that's got to mess with your head too. It's like, what in the world? Why are we dealing with this situation like this? I mean, what the hell? You know, the kid needs, the kids need both parents. The kid needs stability. The kids need two parents who can communicate and talk and make sure that the, that the real best interest of their child is, is paramount. That, you know, sometimes we can, there's things that we can do. I think that the best thing that we can do when going through these situations is make sure we're good evaluators of ourselves. What could I do different? Uh, is there any of this that I've got to own? Because let's yeah. be honest, none of us are perfect, right? I've had situations that came to the table. I can't talk to my ex. They won't sit down. They won't do anything. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be like, hey, look, tell them I, I want to meet you. Let's sit down. Let's talk about this. You can pick a place. I'll, I'll come yeah. and I, I'll let you do this. And just showing them that, hey, I'm, I'm willing to do a little bit of give and take. And I've seen a lot of families com- get back together and they may they might not get back together in a, in a loving yeah, relationship, right. but they get back together in that co-parenting relationship. And it's better than ever just because they let their guard down and say, let's make it about the child. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's it, man. When, when you're fussing over the, the money and retirement and alimony is one of those things that have, doesn't really make sense to me. Um, but there's so much in there. I'm loving that, that one. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lifetime alimony. But, uh, Anyways, on that, let's uh, let's pivot a little bit more to um, the the documentary. It's coming out on this weekend. On uh, let me pull this back up. So it's coming out uh, in two days and a few hours, October third at five p.m. Yeah. So, and I know you're doing a lot to try to try to uh, get a lot of people to um, tune in when it when it releases. And so what do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about just what you, the whole process? I mean, cause making a documentary is not easy, right? I mean, so yeah. I'm assuming that, that was a, that was a huge thing to bite off. So you want to talk a little bit about that process and, and, uh, just putting it all together? Yeah. You know, it, it was, um, and having to run a channel in between doing something like this too, um, was very hard and responding to everybody. But, um, we did this documentary on next to no budget. It was completely crowdfunded. And for anybody that's here, um, just to kind of show you how important this is to us and that we want you to get it out there to other people. This is 100% free. 
we didn't put it on there. We're not selling the documentary. It's not anything that we're trying to get distributions. There's no ads on it. This is 100% free so that you can take this, send it to your legislators. If you're going through false allegations, if you're going through parental alienation, you got friends, family that doesn't understand what it is you're going through. We made this in hopes to educate other people. And as much as I hate to say this, it's the extreme stories like this where a father dies or something goes horribly yeah. wrong. That wakes people up. It really does. When they see that, it's shocking. Oh, my God, what happened? I want to get involved. And that's the sad part about this is uh, you don't see as much involvement until something like this does happen. The media doesn't report on what we're going through until there is a father or a child or a mom that's been killed at a custody exchange or in one of these CPS situations. So, um, you know, we were actually set to start filming a documentary up in Michigan about a 14 year old that was burned in a hotel fire while his mom was making drugs. Uh, that was a story that's very close to dad talk. We raised money to save his life. He's been through about 200 something surgeries. He's 18 now. And that was a case of alienation. And then I woke up the morning of February 6th to a text message from John's sister saying that he had got murdered. That feeling, man. Um, yeah, I, I can't even put it into words, guys. We completely stopped everything that we was doing, got tickets, went up to Idaho. It was minus 30 degrees while we was up there. That was another challenge we had. I've never, I'm a Georgia boy. <laughs> we don't do cold like that. But uh, getting up there, uh, John's case went down in North Dakota. He was murdered in Idaho. His funeral was in Montana. And to be able to get to all of those, we actually had to fly into Washington State. So we literally drove all the way across the country getting footage in each one of these locations to put this together. And uh, I'm proud of it. I'm very proud of you it. We, be, learned, man. we learned a lot during this process. If we do it again, I think it, uh, <laughs> you know, we'll know a yeah. little bit different of how to structure things. But um, this is this is for you guys. Again, if you're if you're somebody struggling through it that it feels like nobody understands what you're going through show them this this is what they need to see and hopefully we can make some more films like this and raise that awareness you know one thing else i i just want to mention because i remember i remember whenever you when this whole thing happened if i you know, correct me if i'm wrong but i've I, originally in the morning it was a joyous thing because he finally was going to get to see his kids the yes. the last minute appeal to try to stop it was was uh, thrown out, so I mean it, it you know I mean I think you fully expected at the end of that night to not get that phone call but to hear hear hey I I finally got to see my kids it was great I got to show them some stuff and maybe get a picture or something I mean because I know you kind of had started developing a relationship or a friendship kinship with with John, so you the last thing you expected was that phone call. Yes. Um, and that's one of the regrets that I've got, you know, the, on all of the social media profiles right now, we're, we're, we're nearing a half a million followers and the messages, it's just me. I've got other people that help with dad talk but when it comes to running all of that. It's just yeah. me. So sometimes I'm, I'm behind on messages. John had wrote me earlier that week saying, Hey, I won. And, uh, you know, I liked it and let him know that, you know, I had seen it and everything and I didn't get to reach back out to him, man, how you feeling or anything. I don't know what I was in the middle of doing and then waking up and getting that news. I mean, this was just a couple of months after him being on the show and now I'm standing over his casket. This is my first time meeting him is standing over his, uh, earthly body. That was, that was so hard. John thought he was going to get to see his kids you know one of the yeah. things just to show you how supportive of a family he had his brother and sister was there they was standing right beside him when he got shot and was killed um they had called john earlier that day asked him if he wanted them to be there he said no i've got this guys they live like four hours away they came anyway they came anyway because they wanted to be there for john and they knew how volatile of a situation that it was so it was just a, it was a shocker to everybody. I mean, you never want to think stuff like this yeah. can happen, but um, it's becoming a reality for people all across the nation. Let me ask you this: in retrospect, and I know you've you've talked to you've interviewed a ton of people, and a lot of it's in the documentary. Um, did any in retrospect did anyone have any warning signs that that something like this could potentially happen? 
so there's a scene in there where we asked the family if anybody, you know, John thought that this could happen. And uh, I think there was some premonitions there, but nobody wants to think that somebody you once had a relationship with. I mean, usually the family, and that was his yeah. kid's grandfather, for goodness sakes. Um, nobody, you know, you just, you never know what's going on in somebody's head at that point in time. Um, but I think, I think he had a clue. I do. Oh, really? Yeah. I think, I think he, there, there were some, definitely some signs and some things that have been said prior to that, that John knew that the situation could go dark. You know, but the, but the problem is unless there's some real overt threats, what do you do? Right. I mean, he was ambushed. I mean, it's like, there's, I mean, realistically, he, he, even if he would have known what exactly can you do to prevent somebody from walking up and shooting you three times and, and saying, hi, hi, John. You know, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like, how do you protect yourself from something like that? So John, when he saw the car pulling up, he actually just turned his back. He thought mom's bringing me the kids. He was, yeah. um, from what I was told, buckling up, I think the car seat. And then that's when he turned around and was met by his father-in-law. I mean, I think hindsight, you know, and looking back in the rearview mirror, we could say lots of things. But being there in that moment, um, you know, here lately, there's been people saying, hey, we're bulletproof this. I mean, look at the guy that it happened to in Michigan a couple of weeks ago. He got shot in the face. A bulletproof face, vest man. wouldn't have helped you. Um, people are saying, hey, do it at police stations if you think it's going to get that bad. I was shocked to see probably about 75% when I did my research and my study of custody exchanges and people getting shot happened at the police station. Well, wasn't it, that it, when it, you were just talking about? I thought that, that the guy who was shot in the face, that was at a police station, wasn't it? Or no? That that one, I believe, was at a daycare. And there were shots oh, that geez. actually made its way into the daycare where the children were. But, That's outstanding. Um, the majority of these are at the police stations from what I've seen. And another thing that I've seen, guys, uh, I'd say nine out of ten, it's always mom's boyfriend or somebody else doing it. It's very rarely is it that actually the other parent. Um, and that's that's a little alarming. I'd like to get some more research and statistics on that. But that goes to show, like, if you're in a contentious situation, keep the the uh, the new wife or the new husband, new new boyfriend, new girlfriend, keep them out of it. Come together and co-parent your kids because these are the situations that are starting to pop up. Yeah, uh, the wise chat manager just posted. It says in New York, body armor is illegal. So that's a good really? point. Some places you can. And I think in California, it's the same way. You, I don't think legally you can buy it because it's law enforcement only. So. I mean, so that's the other thing. You got to be careful on on whether you're violating laws too. And you know, and the sad part of not sad, but the reality of it is, is if you start acting like that, people are going to start thinking. Until something happens, they'll start thinking you're paranoid. It's like, what are you oh, doing? Definitely. You know, I mean, it's like it's it's like a lose lose situation all the way around. <laughs> and Dwayne, I mean, and, and another thing, a lot of these places where you're not allowed to carry, you know, your gun as a self defense. Yeah. Uh, gun free zones is where the shootings are happening, where some of the the biggest yeah. shootings are happening. So it's like, how do you protect yourself? And when you got a father like John, and you got situations like this a couple of weeks ago, where these guys are following the system, they're following yep. the rules that was set up for them, and it's still failing them. At what point do they wake up and say? Our system has failed. We've got to change this. We need change. But again, it's like they just turn their heads. They don't listen to it because there's too much money coming in. We've we've interviewed hundreds of legislators at this point, hundreds of legislators just this year, 42 states that we've been to since the beginning of this year. And uh, just getting these legislators to hear about these issues, it's Republicans and Democrats, guys. I'm not giving anybody a pass on this. It's both sides. Um, it's sad. It's sad um, when you realize that half of our legislators are attorneys um, and there's a reason they're, again, just turning their face from it. When I talk to the media and when I talk to some of the, the bigger production companies, they always tell me, ah, this is just really sad. We can't report on sad stuff like this or it's not sexy. Well, I didn't yeah. know the news was supposed to be sexy. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know it was supposed to be happy. I mean, if these are situations that are on and this is the outcome we need awareness speaking of speaking of that i wanted to ask you this so 
what has been the media's uh, following of this story? I mean, is it, I mean, obviously, I don't think I've ever heard of it in national national news. Now, to be perfect, in full disclosure, I don't spend a lot of time watching news anymore. But how has the media been covering this John Mass story? So local media um, is reporting on these situations, uh, but national seems to stay silent. When it comes to the John Mass situation now, OAN did do an interview with me um, last month, and I was very appreciative. They had very fair coverage on there, and I had no time to prepare for that. And I actually, when they started the interview, they had a video of me talking about John on there, which kind of caught me off guard before we got into the interview. But uh, Dr. Drew, I went on Dr. Drew, and he talked about it. it. As far as like main media, I've tried reaching out to like Fox. I'll talk to CNN. I'll talk to Newsmax. I don't care what your political affiliations is. Let's get this out there. But um, for the most part, they they stay silent. You got the, the situation about what's her name, Gabby Petito right now. And I know, you know what, that is a very tragic situation and they need to be covering it. At the same time, John had all those elements too. The father yeah. a couple of weeks ago, whose uh, nine, nine-year-old daughter and a uh, four-year-old stepsister was stabbed by their mom, that deserved attention too. Um, but those are the ones they usually... Um, just keep tight lips on about it. And they, again, they say it's not sexy, so we can't report on that. It, the, the media needs conflict and they like to feed the same BS every single day to keep people arguing because that's what drives the ratings. And unfortunately the people fall for it. Yeah. I mean, and, and then I think the sad reality is, is most people think that this doesn't really happen that if there's allegations, it's probably true. Kind of like what you were talking about earlier, right? I mean, it's like, who really wants to touch something where you might accidentally be on the wrong side of it? And, and, and Eric, this is why I think what you're doing is so amazing is you're, you're, I mean, you're making some serious strides. Guys, if you, you know, here, let me, I want to just, I just want to, I'm going to switch off this for a second. So I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to pull up your channel. And I want people to see, let me just do a new tab pull this up. So the, the, the people that you're able to talk to are, and I'm trying to scroll down. You got uh, celebrity interviews. I'll just click on this, uh, pause it. You know, you got all these, you know, different John Snyder, you know, uh, FBI agents, you know, you've got Ben Carson, Alex, you know, Alex Jones is ex. I mean, and I mean, this is just a subset of it. I mean, you are, you're killing it on getting a lot of people to, to talk about this issue. And I, and I know, I, I can't remember who it was, but I remember maybe it was when you went to CPAC, there was somebody, a, a, I think a lawmaker that you spoke to who actually was living this, was dealing with this situation. And, st and even at that level still didn't real, I don't think that guy realized how prevalent this crap really is. Right. There's been several. Uh, when when this happened with John, we went to Boise, Idaho and went up to the Capitol there and was shocked to find the senator in his city where he was murdered, said that he had went through the same exact thing as John with the false allegations, the divorce. And we've had more and more of these legislators yeah. come and tell us, hey, I, I know what's going on here. Well, it's like, well, why aren't you talking about it? The, the key thing here is these legislators are told to stick to the same topics, the CRT, right. abortion, economy, the things that you see people fussing about all the time. Mm -hmm. So they rarely step outside of it. But the more they see us going in there and making a topic, you know, I've gotten lots of influencers to talk about this. And I yeah. take so much flack for that, Dwayne. Uh, for the most part, everybody's very positive about it and glad that we're getting it out. When I very first started doing this, all I ever heard was, I, I wish we could get celebrities and bigger politicians talking about it. Well, now that it is, you're wanting to be famous or you're wanting to get some type of status. No. If you can get these guys on here, like Matt Hughes, he was a, one of the best UFC fighters ever. Guys, he's going through it right now, too. Um, but when people tune in to find out about him, his fan base, there is people on the outside that are learning about this. And then that's how we breed new advocates where I think the movement has went wrong in the past. We're kind of in our own echo chamber. If you're here yeah, for the most part, absolutely. I guarantee you, you're going through it. You know what's going on, but yeah. we've got to educate them. How do we get yeah, to them? Let's find a way to get these outside eyeballs in there. So I've tried to kind of take that entertainment angle and some of these influencers and bring them in here you have in to. hopes yeah. in hopes of getting that awareness up. So no, and I know, and I know you get, 
you get, I mean, there's always people who are going to throw, you know, try to trip you up, you know, and, I, and I've, we've talked offline about it, but I mean, you know, some of the, it seems like you, you go and you talk to certain politicians and it's like, why are you picking that side? And you constantly say, I'm not picking a side. I'm trying to get the information out there. And, and one of the things I just want to add on this is I think one of the, the biggest problems with like the normal men's rights type movement is it, it's been so uh, vilified and the messaging yeah. can get taken out of context that people don't even listen to it. It's like, you know, you start saying certain things and, and you get tuned out. So what I think is really incredible about what you're doing, Eric, is people are now talking to you. They're willing to, to say this where I guarantee you that some of the people you were talking to, if some of these other personalities on, on, on the more, fr I wouldn't say fringe, but kind of on it, they wouldn't even acknowledge it because they wouldn't even want to be associated with it. So the fact that people are willing to sit down on your show and have a conversation about this is, 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 cr I mean, is critically important. I wish I could do what you were doing, man, to be honest, you're doing great work on that. Thank you. I mean, I think the, the, the biggest example that comes to me when we're talking about this, I had Ted Nugent on the show. Yeah. And when uh, you either love him or hate him, you're on one of those <laughs> sides, but he's yeah. a very well-known figure and he says what's on his mind, but he came on the show. People like, why are you getting Ted on there? And I was like, you know, trust the process guys. There's, there's a reason why we do the things that we do. But one of the topics that I talked to Ted about is I know he's into hunting and doing all these, you know, manly things. I, I got on the topic of toxic masculinity. I don't believe we're suffering from toxic masculinity. It's a lack of masculinity. And Ted really enjoyed that conversation. Yeah. I literally watched his next three interviews when he went on the media and he talked about the, the myth of toxic masculinity. And I said, there you go. That's the little seed that we planted, yeah. right? Exactly. Um, you Exactly. The, that's where you don't really realize where it's going until you see it a little bit later on. But these are little seeds that we're planting everywhere we go. Um, I, I can tell you, CPAC last year when we first got there, nobody was talking about family issues. Nobody was touching this. Yeah. And uh, they liked us. So we got in there and we got on Media Row. A lot of the legislators talked to us this past year when we went to CPAC. Boy, was it different. We was one oh, of the yeah. most popular booths there. Um, we had a new topic that many of these legislators had been through and many of them had family members that had been through it and they was, every one of them was interested in getting there and speaking about it. So I think the more that we can make it that hot topic, maybe we will become one of those issues that becomes a part of their party. This is exactly. what we stand for. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think that's, and I, and I think that's why what you're doing is so important. You know, and I, and I know, and I mentioned this a minute ago, I mean, people like to throw stones and, you know, say, oh, you're trying to do this or that, or you're, you're clout chasing or whatever. No, you're, here's the thing. And I was going to say this, and I, and I know we've talked about this offline. You don't want to be doing this. This is not no. your lifelong <laughs> dream to run dad talk today and be an advocate for this. I mean, you know, I don't know how many times we've talked where you're like, dude, I want this. So I want to fix this and move on. You want to talk I, I about like I like doing like the interviews and getting to talk to other people. And I just like helping people. I'm a pastor's right. son. That's what I saw my dad do. If there, my dad wasn't that big glitzy pastor that had the mega church. He had 30 people that came on Sundays in there, but I watched him day after day, always helping families and making sure he was feeding the poor and helping pay somebody's bills or uh, helping a family that was grieving. He really instilled that in me. And that's, you know, that's lessons. He died back in 2013 that I'm going to carry for the rest of my life. And that's one thing I, I, I want to thank my dad so much for putting into me. But if I'm being honest, transparent with you, I hit the ground running when we did this. And there was days that I just did not quit. I'll work until four o'clock in the morning, wake up at eight and I'm right back on it again. Wife, yeah. everybody's telling me, Eric, get away from it. When John died, the week before that, I had just looked at my wife and told her, I can't do this anymore. One, hearing these stories all the time, and that's all I'm consuming, guys. You, Just like they say, you are what you eat. Uh, what you're having in your life every day is what you become. And all I heard all day was everybody's horrific stories. And there was days I just couldn't sleep. I was having problems. Uh, we struggle financially because, I mean, we're, we are not very well funded. We're fighting a $60 billion a year industry, and we're doing the best with what we've got. 
um, it was I was done, man. I told her, I was like, I just want to go back to work in a normal day job and get away from it. I'll still try to help people, but I got to get away from it. And then that morning when I woke up and got the news um, on John, those little embers that was burning out, it's like somebody just took gasoline and threw that fuel on the fire. I was ready for war. At that yeah. point, I was ready for war. And I wrote off the fumes of that up until recently. <laughs> um, you know, I just I had I've been exhausted as of lately, man. I just had to take a little bit. You know, I had to get this documentary out. I kind of yeah. want to step back for a second, take a little break. And that's well, another it, important man. thing for the, the viewers, too, man. I mean, even if you're going through these family law battles, guys. Give yourself a break. If this is all you're consuming all day long, I'm telling you, and it's easy to do. It's easy to do. And that's the that's the bad thing about alienation. If you're being kept from your kids, if you're, you're having to give all your money, um, it's hard to get that off your mind. But realize you're doing everything you can do. Find a little bit of forgiveness. Take care of yourself. The reason they do this in the first place is because they don't want you to live a life. They want to destroy you. They don't want you to have happiness. Don't they give want- them that. Don't give yeah, them that. Yeah, they want to break you. That's if it. Can, if they can break you, that's uh, then they win. You know, one one thing I wanted to 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 mention is um, you know, maybe people don't understand. You do this full time, and 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 yeah. and you've you know, whenever you know, a couple of years ago, you kind of you know downturn. You had an opportunity, or not an opportunity, <laughs> like a forced opportunity to take a break from work. But I mean, you've dived into this. I mean, I I know. I mean. What I do, I do with a full-time job and 50-50 custody. And there are times where it gets me. That's why, you know, with what you're doing, I, there's no way, you know, not many people are in the situation where they can do what you're doing. So guys, if, if um, you know, if you have any opportunity to support Eric, and I know sometimes people we were talking about before, you know, when you're trying to get funding to, to, to go to these, some of these locations so you can do the filming and stuff. You know, I mean, you're doing this out of pocket. You're not independently wealthy. Your dad talk today is not making you a hundred grand a year. I mean, you are, you are, if this wasn't for you, this wouldn't exist. Yeah. You would not, if it wasn't for the people, it wouldn't exist. I think people see the work that goes into it. And I got to say, as much as we struggle sometimes, we wouldn't be here, you know, without them. When, when that happened with John, yeah. we had uh, two days to buy those tickets. And if anybody yeah. is familiar with the Northwest, there's no airports out there. It cost a thousand dollars a piece. Me, uh, Melissa and Robert, a thousand dollars a piece. There's three grand. The rental car was a thousand dollars because we're taking it from Washington and there. There's four grand right there. But it was donated overnight. I yeah. mean, people stepped up and made sure that they took care of us. But there's other times when situations aren't like this going on. I hate asking for money. When that's when I said when, oh, yeah. I, when I very first started Dad Talk, I was hoping about talking about some other situations and and, and building a channel to where you and get the Patreons and different stuff like that. But yeah, I yeah. realized this is where it's needed. This is where we've got to fight. And that's where I was called to be. And it's hard to ask people sometimes because I know they've been taken by attorneys. I know they've been yeah. taken by custody evaluators and therapists and all these other people. And, uh, you know, once you've been burned by somebody, you start thinking everybody is out to get me. So, there's times that I don't ask that I probably need to, but um, I mean, I'm sitting in a studio right now. I wish you guys could see it. Um, I mean, it is a complete, you know, 600 square foot studio. We got yeah, everything we need in here. Yeah, man. It's um, and you funded. I mean, you, you, if I remember correctly, you took what savings you had to make that happen, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I lost my job. Um, I was hoping to go. After my daughter, I still haven't gotten to see my daughter. This is three years. People will say, just take her to court. It, it takes money. It takes money. Okay. It takes money, and it was money I didn't have. I finally got a new job. I left a job of six years to get um, this new job, and hopefully I was going to make more money so I could go get a lawyer and do what I needed to do. They promised me everything in the world. I was there one month, and they told us to stay at home uh, nationwide, um, that we was going to have a phone-in meeting. And they told us that they were shutting the company down. They, they hired me, and one month later, fired everybody, shut the company down. And I was like, yeah. what am I going to do now? Um, this was something that kind of just came overnight, like dad talked today. And, uh, you know, I went and got the website. I told my wife about it, and I had people that laughed their butts off at me. And, uh, but I knew. I knew what we was building and there yep. was no failure in it. But 
like I said, it kind of went in a different direction and it's made it a little hard because my audience, uh, they're not deadbeats. Like people claim they are, they're dead broke. Um, yeah. most of them. Yeah. I hear they, you on that one. I want to, I want to cover or hit this one, one comment is actually a super chat too, but Maconia had asked earlier. So Eric, are there parental alienation help and advocates for parents in uh, Canada? Do you know of any resources for people who are basically the target of parental alienation? Uh, so man, uh, that's a place that we're wanting to really get up to and target. I've, I've had to get some of these other things off of our back, but I'd say there's probably 20, 25% of our audience is up in Canada. Uh, they're going through similar yeah. issues. Canada's and it is pretty rough. You know, that the sad thing is they're having to reach out to, uh, you know, an American audience and some of these American experts because they don't have as many yeah. up that way. And there are so many people that are going through it. So they need a chapter and some stuff set up up there as well. Um, you know, uh, Sylvester Witter would be somebody I would say to reach out to. Um, you can find him on Facebook. Tell him I sent you. He's a really good guy. He knows a lot of people in that area. Um, I'm not as, I, I know a lot of them, but he would know a little bit better than me. Okay. Yeah. Maybe after you can give me a link and I'll add it into the show notes. I also want to, there's this other one, a super chat from Eric Godiva says, Eric Carroll for president. Whoops. It didn't show up. Let me, let me put that on the screen. No. <laughs> <laughs> there you yeah. go, man. You need to, you need to have more political aspirations. I also want to hit, uh, oh, go ahead. What are you going to say? I was going to say, I had thought about it guys, because you know, uh, I don't know if you got to see it, Dwayne. Last week, I had um, got and talked in front of the legislature here in Georgia. They're they're talking about doing new child support laws, and nice. It was very sickening. It was very sickening. That I was late. Nice. Cause, <laughs> no, I I was I was late because I had forgot about it. I was actually in the bathtub, just sitting there trying to relax. <laughs> I've been working all day, and then I looked, and I was like. I don't think I'm supposed to be relaxing. I'm supposed to be doing something. And uh, oh dear God. then it hit. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I jumped up, got in my pajamas, and I came and got on the Zoom call. And I was just trying to watch in the background. Oh, my God. But then I heard them say, we need to do something with these parents that are making more money. Um, we need to make sure that they're paying more child oh support. Dear God. That burnt me up. And I was like, raise my hand, raise my hand. And they called on me. And I was like, guys, you said if they're making more money, they need to be paying more ch child support. Why? Um, when did this start being, you know, more based on the money or the percentage of the paycheck? We're supposed to be focusing on the needs of the child. If the child has needs, let's make sure they're met. And that's all that matters here. You guys basing all this other money, like where is it coming from? Do what's in the best interest of the child. Make sure that the needs are met. Make sure that the parents have time and stop making it about money. And there was just like this long moment of silence. But before that, before somebody stood up and said, hey, look, this is what's going on. Um, it was just going on with this. We oh, need yeah. more advocates to step up and run for office. We need you in there. Oh, absolutely. I know, I know that might seem like an intimidating task, but guys, we need people in there to represent us. Uh, most of the people that are in there, they're there to represent their interests. OK, and their interests make sure that your interests aren't represented. So getting people in there. Have I thought about it? I, there was a point I almost ran up against the governor. I was really I was really turning it around there in my mind for a second. But politics is one of the dirtiest things in the game. And, uh, you know, yeah. I think this is where I can make a difference. If, if I can go on a national level and just try to stir up that conversation. Guys, if we can get yeah. this red hot, I mean, red hot. Let's go on everywhere make sure everybody's talking about it that's when you're going to see change absolutely the reason you don't see change right now is because we don't have enough awareness and they can sweep us under the rug uh, we've got to stand up and make that change hey eric Sorry, I I get a little fired up. no that's great man and, and what you just said is completely spot on um i'm going to bring on actually you know this person it's john steinbeck has said he has a couple questions about the children uh -huh. that were left behind so let me bring him on Hello and you welcome guys to the need show. To check out his channel. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Hey guys. Hey Dwayne. Hey Eric. Hey man. Greetings from uh, Kentucky. How you guys doing? Doing good. John, you're not in China right good. now. Hey uh, Eric, have a quick. <laughs> no, I'll be in China in three days. <laughs> yeah. See. Um, hey, I have a quick question for you. I'll get straight to my question. Um, I was always curious. Were you able to meet the children left behind at the funeral, and were they even allowed to go to the funeral? Um, no, um, no, they were not there. And no, I have not. No. Yeah, that's, that's, um, 
do they know? Go ahead. Sorry. Wow, that's sad. That, that speaks volumes right there. Um, do you have any idea if they even know about your documentary? Um, what I would say to that is, guys, we have a surprise for you at the end of that documentary. I don't want to spoil that for you, but there is something I've been holding on to for a couple of months. Um, be watching near the end. And uh, there's some of those updates. You know, that's, that's the one place where I, I wish we had more to give people. But there is a lot of waiting that we've got to do from now to then to get some more of these answers. So it might seem like I'm dancing around that question a little bit. I I promise you I'm not. But, um, you know, I think it's it's sad and it's unfortunate. We don't really know what they've been told and what's going on. Uh, The Mass family hasn't seen them since this happened either. So that's just. Is that being litigated at all? Because obviously uh, I think the uh, the mother's trying to prevent the entire family tree of John's from, uh, from seeing them. You can't really say yeah. much, right? I mean, I know. I, I mean, I, what I, I guess I, I'll, I'll chime in because maybe I can say something. I, I think, uh, uh, John, what you're saying is, is spot on, right? I mean, you know, effectively she was a, the, the mom was able to kind of win the day on this because of this catastrophe and it's going to take the family they're going to have to go through their own process to ultimately be able to get back in that, in the kids' lives. And that's another tragedy of this whole thing. Well, and, and now think about this right. too, though, wow. guys, like, I mean, it's, it's hard to talk about again. I got to dance around it some, but the last time somebody went to pick up the kids was John and look what happened. Yeah. true. So you got to be very careful in situations yeah, like this. Yeah. You know what? Well, yeah. Thanks a lot guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for hey, calling thanks, John. John, man. So uh, let me, hold on. Let me turn that off. Um, yeah, that, you know, he brings up another question. We didn't, we haven't talked about this and I, and I don't know if you can, Eric. So let me, let me, uh, let me ask this question. Hold on. Let me, I didn't actually hit the right button. Um, what's, what's the status of the criminal case? And um, so the, the, is the, is the father-in-law still, I mean, pending trial and jail, um, can you can you report on any of what what's going on? He's in jail. The murder trial will begin in March 2022. They just had a hearing um, last month, and it got set for March of 2022. God, it takes so long for this stuff to happen. So let me. And I know you probably can't answer this, but I know everyone's going to be wanting to know: is has anything happened with the mom being held accountable for her part in this? Um, as of this point, no. I know I, I, geez, that's, that's just kind of like just lingers. Cause right. I mean, you throw that out there and it's like, it's, that's painful. It is. And, uh, that's, that's all I can say on it, Dwayne. I mean, there's, I, I have the same questions that you guys got and probably the same, um, desires, but, um, yeah, no, nothing, nothing right now. Well, I'll just pull this uh, this comment blue had written uh, parental alienation is very dangerous. And I think, you know, everything we've been talking about tonight, it is. I mean, it's like y- y- you the, it can just be annoying. It can be to where they're trying to do false allegations or it can be to what we're talking about tonight to where it turns violent and deadly. I mean, and, it, and it's, you know, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you don't really know what you're dealing with. You don't, um, you know, I, I was talking about another case, you know, I had the father on and these cases, man, they, they, they really wear on you. It's, it's, we're not just talking about a regular alienation case when you're talking about a situation where a parent or a, the worst ones is when a child dies. Right. Um, but I had the, the father on a couple of weeks ago. Um, he actually had full custody of his daughter and the mom reached out saying, Hey, I'd like to get the kids for the weekend. And he was like, of course you can, you can have the kids. This was in New Jersey. Um, at that point she never brought the child back. Uh, she left New Jersey and went to Arizona. You're starting to hear that so much more where they're going across state lines. I don't know why they're not prosecuted to the fullest extent when that, the second that happens. Um, and I, as much as this, you know, I, I try not to make it about gender. I can't help but think if this was on the other side, he would be under the jail right now. 
Um, but when she got to Arizona, she kept the kids. He called CPS. He called the, the courts. He called everybody. Nobody would do anything, even though he had custody of the child. Um, and then he found out a couple of weeks ago, just in like a, a mad fit when it was time to bring the child back. Um, she stabbed the nine year old like several different times. And then the nine year old had a four year old stepsister stabbed her several different times, killed both of her daughters and then went in a bedroom and stabbed herself multiple times, tried to kill herself. But uh, she's an ICU right now. But you got cases where, you know, right after that happened, just a couple of days ago, we're talking about the custody exchanges. Uh, that, that same thing happened in Florida where a mom killed herself and all of the kids when it was time yeah. to take the kids to the dad. Um, it's what what is going on, Dwayne? What is there something that just says that this is that subject that cannot be touched? Um, it really depends on us right now, guys, to get out there and bring these stories. And like I said, it can take an emotional toll. I have been so wrapped up in John's story since this happened because I'm we're his voice now. Yeah, we're his voice. And he wanted that story to get out. So it's been really hard just to separate from it. But, uh, you know, people need to see these cases. And it, without you guys, it's it's not going to happen. Well, we, I mean, and, and, you know, and the hard part about this is a lot of people who are our audience are dealing with the worst experience of their lives. And everything seems to be so catastrophic. And then when you hear stories like this, the worst case scenarios, I mean, you just rattled, I mean, you just rattled off a bunch of them. It can be really, you know, devastating to your, to your own sanity thinking, oh crap, this is going to be my situation. Or, you know, like, like you were talking about earlier, I was like, I'm going to be the next John Mass. I'm going to be the next this, the next that. And, you know, one of the things that's tough is we are, are anybody who is going through this really has to work on your own mental health work on your own emotional stability because it is so easy to get wrapped up into the to the 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 uh the potential badness of this that you just lose your 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 hope and you know once you start doing that you make mistakes and things just start going south you know um i don't know what do you do you have anything you want to add on to that yeah you know I, that's what i said very early on you know try to be mindful of your your own situation because that's when you can much more clearly see what's going on on the other side you know i've always said if there's anything i've done in this life i'll be the first one to tell you about it and uh you know i've i've had things that i got on in my situations and my relationships at the same time when you start using that child as a weapon there is no reason that i i should not be with my child right now yeah. that's when you've get you can paint the picture much more clear for somebody uh, when, when, I can accept my own. It's not like I'm just sitting here trying to make them, them bad. You know yeah, what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that's just growth as a person as well. Um, I think mistakes sometimes can be one of the greatest things we ever go through because that's where we learn. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm finding out about that. Um, but yeah, I think there was, there was a comment yeah. that I wanted to go over. Uh, Maconia D said, DSD tally about John's diaries for his kids. Um, so when John was on the show back in Thanksgiving, he was the first one to sign up. Um, one of the things that I was asking him is since he had been through it for a few years, Hey, John, tell everybody what you've done to make it through this. What are some of the things that have helped you keep it off your mind during the holidays? And, uh, he, he said a few things. And then I asked him, I was like, have you ever thought about writing a journal, writing to the kids, letting them know that you're thinking about them? And John said, yes, I've actually wrote journals for a while. So when I got the news that morning, that was the first thing that hit me. I said, I got to get in touch with the family. I wrote them. I said, John had journals for those kids. Make sure that you find them because that might be the only way they ever hear his side is, uh, you know, through those journals. They found him and it was that was so hard to look at. I mean, he had four separate books to where he was going in like on a daily basis, just write messages to the kids. And this is even though he was murdered in 21, um, back in 2018, if you go back and read some of those messages, it's almost like John really knew 
that something was going to happen. There was a couple of them that he wrote and he said, I'll, I'll always love you. I'll always be watching over you in this life and in the next. And I was like, why, why would you, why would you say it that way? Um, but you know, that's, that's something too, yeah, you know, guys, if you think you're in these situations, write your kids, these journals, uh, if you're not being able to see them, let them know, Hey, I was thinking about you personally. I haven't wrote any journals. I'll be upfront about that. That's because I'm on dad talk every day. I'm just like, yeah. you want a journal? Go look at what daddy did. Yeah, <laughs> but, that's fine. You know, have that's something where you can show the kids you was thinking about him. No, that's a good point. Hey, I'm going to try to bring on a uh, caller on line two. Uh, right. So this will be ho hopefully caller. If just try to keep everything focused on this particular topic. Hello and welcome to the show. Adrian, hey, Eric. Hey, how's it hey. going? Uh, I started to, uh, well, uh, quick aside, I, I got my kids back today. Outstanding. Uh, that's a whole, that's for another time. Oh, yeah. Very excited. Uh, and it was a smooth transition. But uh, I was wondering, like, when I, Eric, when I first saw you on, uh, on DSB uh, back, what was it, March, uh, when John Ness died? Yeah. Uh, it made me think, like, oh, my God, is that going to happen to me? And uh, I was just wondering, uh, like, sure, I've been doing the documenting. Sure, I've been doing the audio recording. Uh, but it, it, to date, not a single person that matters is willing to take a hard look at my wife, uh, whom we're, we're the longest running court case in, in our county. Uh, down the court, and uh, if there was one more piece of advice you could give John, uh, aside from like wear body armor, and I just uh, let me just jump in real quick, just so it? so for for people who don't know, and I don't, and Eric, you probably don't. This caller is dealing with massive false allegations, been run through the ringer, but the difference is is CPS has has determined it's unfounded. The detectives re, uh, investigating the case because he was criminally investigated, has found it's unfounded. And he's constantly dealing with these false allegations of very horrific abuse towards his kids. So when he said he just, the ex or the wife, because he's still going through litigation, is still creating more drama. So just recently, through another uh, TRO, you know, he was denied access to the kids, had to put, you know, had to get that removed. And what he was saying is, is that again, like for the sixth or fifth or sixth time, it's been unfounded and he's, his visitation or his custody has been reinstated. So that's, that's a little bit of the background of what this caller is asking. And, and what's your name again? And, and I guess one other piece. Well, let's not use his name. Uh, born in oh, Arizona. okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, he I, calls I, I himself call Borna. When you had a, uh, <laughs> for borderline narcissist. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, but I, I guess one thing that throws a wrench into the into my situation is my wife is, has a live-in boyfriend who spent about six years in prison. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know he uh, got by my house. So that's what what he's talking about is kind of what we were talking about earlier is you know when you were saying it's always the new the new relationship that tends to be more violent. Well, in his particular situation, the new relationship is has been criminally found, you know, violent, right? So he, you know, on top right. of just being a normal, a normal person, this is somebody who has been prosecuted and went to jail for, um, violence basically. Wow. So, you know, I, I, I my answers would be, you know, pretty generic. I, I mean, they're important, but, um, and not trying to be, you know, a downer on it. If I could go back and tell him anything would be, you know, John, if you're going through this, one, you, you got to make sure you document everything. Uh, if they if they try to gaslight you and get in an argument or whatever, let them do that. You keep it about the kids. You stay focused. And, and when, when they do that, you document it. Um, police station, uh, if you feel like it's getting very contentious, police station, bulletproof vest, you know, I mean, some of this might sound silly, but I'm, I'm sure that a lot of those other guys, the reason they didn't have it is they didn't think it would go to that extent either. Right. At the same time, you know, talking about this, like I said, you know, earlier in uh, Detroit, I mean, the guy was shot in the face. Um, you take every precaution 
that you can. If something doesn't feel right, listen to your gut and uh, make sure that people are notified. Make sure you got somebody there with you. Um, yeah, man, that would be. I mean, these situations are the, just the, the all too thing real. Is, uh, I've been alienated from my neighborhood community, from yeah. my children's school community, from. Yeah. Like I, I, I have zero friends in my town. Uh, that's I used to. Yeah. yeah. Well, that that's that's the sad yeah. part. Character assassination. Remember, yeah. I was just talking about that. They want to completely assassinate your character, and there's always going to be people that believe it and uh, they play into it. That's the reason they do the smear campaigns and things that they do. And unfortunately, uh, they're inclined to believe her. And what I'll add also onto this is. In his situation, CPS, they won't write him anything, but what they have done is they said, look, if you sign a release and have Bill call, we'll tell them what's going on. I mean, when, when do you ever hear that? I mean, you know, so, but even with that, right? I mean, there's, there's all this crap going on, and the, the, what, this, what this caller is dealing with is that unknown, or, you know, people just looking and, and just kind of whispering and going, wow, is it true? Is it not true? Do I want to take the risk? You know, it's horrible. Garza said the same thing. You know, uh, my buddy that works with me on Dad Talk, you know, after going through the allegations, he'd say, you know, you'd see people whispering in each other's ears. And like, no matter how much you prove your innocence, it's yeah. you, you got that stigma with you for the rest of your life. And I, I can't um, tell you guys how sorry I am enough. Um, I hate that anybody would have to go through something like this and uh, there should be severe consequences there should be very severe Absolutely. consequences you are ruining someone's life when you do this you're taking away everything not is, is one thing just to take their money but now you're taking away your character friends don't yeah. want to listen to me co-workers don't want to listen to me um it's just a it's a lose-lose situation all the way around man that's for sure all right caller thanks for calling let me hit the the Try to hit the buttons here. Um, it looks like someone had a super chat that I may have missed. So let me uh, let me see if my moderator copied it and I can. Uh, is there anything you want to hit while I'm trying to search around, figure out what yeah, I'm doing? Yeah, and sorry to the caller there. Like I, you know, being on the show, sometimes I forget. Like even when John came on back at Thanksgiving, we just went by John. We didn't say his name. We didn't say his kid's name. So I, I realized there was some personal stuff in there, and uh, there's that need for anonymity. So it wasn't trying to do that. I was trying to find out a way to address. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> you know, w w what do you do in a situation like that though, Dwayne? It's hard um, because these are people that are looking for justice in a system and trying to make sense out of it in a system that doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, and the, and the problem with it is, is it, it's, it's, you know, I, I don't know how am I going to try to say this. When I was going through my situation, okay, so my situation compared to everything we were talking about is benign, right? I mean, the fact that I was stressed about it, the fact that I was, you know, losing my mind and, and there were days I didn't even know if I would make it through this compared to what other people have had dealt with makes it feel like I don't even have a right to, to feel that way. I agree However, with you. <laughs> but, but what I will say is anybody who's going through this, that pain and that stress and that anxiety is real, right? So you can't discount it perspective might change it. But, but what I was going to get at is when I started this, when I started my situation, you know, two decades of marriage, three children, you know, from 13, 11, six, I think if I remember correctly, I couldn't fathom that somebody that I would have died for that I would have given the world to could in an instant flip a switch and would use any any dark secret, anything out of context to destroy my character, to make up false allegations, to say that I did some horrific things to her. Thank God she didn't say I did things to the kids. But, but I mean, it was devastating. It was devastating to be betrayed. Not, not like, I mean, when someone cheats on you, that's one thing. But when someone yeah. betrays your trust like that, it, it, it's a pain that you can't even understand. And, and when you're going through it, you can't even fathom that another human that you loved could do that. 
Yeah, it's the dark say, part yeah. about it. You know, <laughs> when you get in a relationship with somebody, you give them these intimate details about yourself. You tell them, you know, there's vulnerable. In building a relationship, we show vulnerability. We show them these this side of us. We tell them the secrets, our fears, everything, because through that vulnerability, uh, we trust them with that. And that's how we build that trust. And in return, that trust builds love. Uh, that's how we build yeah. a relationship. When you're talking to somebody like this, like this alienator that wants that control that will play these tricks on you, you're giving them all the pieces of the puzzle, the, the, the darkest parts of your life, that when you start to go through this situation later, every bit of that is going to be used against you. I mean, it even did it come into my case? Yeah. Uh, I struggled with addiction when I was younger, when I was in a rock band and everything. Uh, I, I had a struggle with opiates. I've been sober for 12 years. You know, keep in mind, my situation wasn't that long ago. If you read it now, I'm still this very big drug addict, right? Um Oh, and oh, that's yeah. the crazy thing that's that they'll use any little <laughs> dark secret mistakes that you've used in the past. That's who you are now. And it was out of that vulnerability and trust and everything that you was using to build that relationship and that love yeah. that comes to assassinate you. I, I just remind as you were saying that it reminds me of a story. And I'll just say this just real quick. There was a period of time where we were at one of my kids therapy appointments. And uh, so it was, you know, me, the mom and, and one of my kids. And at the end of it, the ex is like, you know, could we have some private time? So they sent the child out and, and the ex proceeded to say, I'm trying to remember what, what the topic was, but it was something along the lines of, uh, you know, you know, whenever, when, whenever Dwayne was 18, you know, he, he did this and that. And I, and I remember looking, I looked over to her and I'm like, you're talking about something we didn't even know each other when this happened. You know, you know, when you're talking about this, we didn't, we weren't together, didn't know each other, weren't dating, weren't married, no nothing. I'm like, what in the world? I mean, it was like 20 somewhat, 25 years ago. <laughs> I mean, like what you just said, man, they will, they will, they will cherry pick anything they can to paint the narrative, you know? I mean, my oh, God, yeah. Eric, if you had one beer too many times, oh my God, he's an alcoholic. You know, he, it's mineral he's, water, Topa Chico, <laughs> or it gets used. Oh my God. Uh -oh. <laughs> but they, they, they will, you know, and I'll be honest with you, Dwayne, I was a pastor's son. I've got a past. Okay. <laughs> I think most of us preachers kids do. I Thank was God Facebook rebellious. didn't exist and Instagram didn't exist back then. Right. <laughs> You're not kidding. I, I think about that all the time. If, if some of those stories would have came out, my God, but you know, I got, yeah. I had a book coming out before too long and, uh, you know, I was reading back through it and I was like, people are probably going to be expecting me to give like all this about my, my past and my exes and stuff. I'm yeah. harder on myself than I am anybody because it was that past that made me who I am today. That's not who I am anymore. That's what made me who I am. And I got through those situations. So I'm very comfortable with my past and I'll, I'll tell you about anything I've been through, but yeah. again, to them, it's a weapon. It's, it's a way oh, to, paint you in any way and then if somebody in the past that's the character that they knew um and they're matching it with who you maybe yeah. once was they fall for it so i have another caller let me grab uh, let me try to yeah. hit this see if this works hello and welcome to the show hello thank you for taking my call this is tony hey tony what's going on man well i've found your channel not too long ago, and I've been really uh, uh, able to relate to a lot of these things that you're talking about. I'm going through court for custody. I have joint custody, but um, it's a long story. Anyway, I wanted to say thanks. And, uh, you know, my son's name that I'm going through court for is Eric. Uh, but this story about John, I'm really curious to hear about it. Uh, it's really sad. Um, but I'm going through some stuff that would take me a long time to explain. Um, but I have court uh, October 14th. And uh, it all started because um, I made a complaint at the front of the court about her taking tax money and because of that she hired a lawyer and put in for change in custody which dismissed my complaints so it's just a mess 
Do you have a question specifically you'd like Eric to answer? No, I just wanted to say I relate, and I don't. I don't really. Have, I want to. I want to learn more about this. I'm learning a lot from your shows, and I figure if I watch his documentary on Sunday, I put a reminder on there that maybe I can learn more. Oh, absolutely. And uh, there was a there was something that you guys said that we could print out. Did we say um, that? Something that we could print out because I go to court on October 14th and I see the CPS court appointed mediator on Saturday, which is like the second time I got to see her in like four months. She's been, she made friends with my um, ex. ex and she's friends with the lawyer and then they're, they're all like friends and it feels like they're all against me. So, and she's painted me as a bad guy. I bought a house and I'm fixing it up. And because it's not all the way done, she's trying to say that I'm, I'm not taking care of him properly. So yeah. since I'm in the middle of doing all this work on the house, now I bought the house and I'm fixing it up and it's one block away from where she lives so that I can be in the same neighborhood when we got the divorce. So I, I've been really discouraged, you know, for a year I've been working on this house every day. And sometimes she'll come over and just start yelling at me in the street when I have people over up and down the neighborhood, gossiping to my neighbors. Um, just really rough. Yeah, It's really a nasty situation. All right. Tony, you got so people to talk to? If I could give any advice. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think I have some things I'll say, and I'm sure Eric does too. Yeah. All right. Thanks for calling, Tony. We'll answer your call offline. Uh, go for it, Eric. Yeah. You know, um, if I could say something to you, my man, just, you know, like, like I said earlier, make sure you're documenting everything. Uh, one thing, if, you, if you're going into court, I would stress to you guys. One of the things that you said at the very beginning, Dwayne, is make sure that we're not diagnosing with bipolar disorder and uh, schizophrenia and parental alienation and all that. It's, yeah, it's, just, it's the same thing when you're going into court. I think uh, when people are dealing with parental alienation, they want to go in there and say, hey, I'm being alienated. This is what's going on. Don't do that. It's the same thing as trying to diagnose your ex. And a lot of times parental alienation is frowned upon inside a family court. You're just using yeah. that to discredit them. Focus on the behaviors. OK, if she's doing the things that you're you're talking about, talking to the neighbors, doing this, doing that, make sure you're documenting that and show them the behaviors. And that is going to be one of the most important things that you're going to need to do carrying forward with that. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, too. I mean, you got to focus on the pattern of behaviors and demonstrating demonstrating what's actually going on. And if you can, depending on if you know what state you're in and whether you can record if she's doing stuff in front of your house then you need to doc document that record it if you can if it's turning into harassment call the cops you know it's i mean it. so it, but it's uh but the other thing i wanted to to say to that caller these people will come in and tell you how what the what they think reality is going to be they'll say you know your house isn't ready for the kids you don't have the capacity to do this, that, and the other. They can say whatever the hell they want. Don't buy yep. into it. Don't believe it. You know, I mean, it's going to take time for you to get your house together. It's going to take time. You know, I mean, people understand that. But what you have to do is you have to stay steadfast in your calm. You know, keep your peace as much as possible. And you want to basically not fall for the fear campaign on top of the smear campaign on top of everything else they're trying to do. The caller's doing the best he can, and you are, you, you, dude. You, you, I mean, you're making, you're trying to make all the best decisions you can. In retrospect, maybe you're looking at it going, "Well, I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that. Whatever." But you're, you're doing the best you can. You have the right intentions in what you're doing. Don't let her derail you from what's going on. And even if you see. What's, you know, if the, if the evaluator seems like they're siding with you, with the other parent, just stay calm, stay focused on what's actually happening, the patterns of behavior and focus on that. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, the gaslighting, you were talking about the smear and the fear campaigns. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot of tricks being played there and uh, there's going to be lies. There's going to be all these different things that make you want to react. And if don't you don't do react, it. the allegations seem to get more and more severe uh, because they yeah. love the argument. They want to keep that going. And if you don't play that game, uh, then they have nobody to play it with and it becomes more and severe. And hopefully people see see it for what it is. But it's so easy. Uh, when you're going through that, you're hearing these lies that are being told about you. You're seeing yeah. your character smeared around. You're seeing your kids used in the middle of this. Of course, you're going to be angry. And by the time you get into court, you're an emotional mess. And you're, you know, judge, let me tell you what I did. Don't do that. Emotions win. I mean, <laughs> emotions win <laughs> cases for women and they lose cases for men. As Melissa Isaac has told me many times, yep. you go in there as an angry dad um, and they're going to be. They're, they're going to take it to you. So just, you know, keep your calm, document. And uh, it sounds like he's on the right track, though. Yeah. From it, what I could you know, but it's so hard, though, right? Because, I mean, I think a lot of times people are on the right track, but you're getting you're just getting slammed from every angle and you start second guessing yourself and then you start falling into the fear of this. And that's the dangerous part, because that's when you start making mistakes. It is. It is. It's uh, and it's very easy for it to happen. Hell, I mean, you know, even without the custody battle, you know, just going through a divorce itself or a breakup. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. I don't know about you guys. The divorce diet is probably the most effective diet I've ever, <laughs> ever been on. Uh, in three months, I went down 60 pounds, Dwayne. Damn, that's a 60. Pounds. I didn't do 60. I think I did 40. But uh, so I have yeah, uh, I uh, oh, uh, Maconia had a question and, and so she consolidated it for me and it says, I was thinking, uh, it was asking Eric, uh, first is how not to tell your kids about parental alienation. Um, I'll just read through it and then we can go back to it. How to get your lawyer to see parental alienation and then how to know when to back down and trust they'll be cooperative versus sticking to your guns. Do you want to hit the, go for it. How not to tell your kids about alienation. So that's, that's a tricky one. I would say for the most part, kids are not meant to bear the weight of their parents' choices. Uh, that's not what they're supposed to be. Now, and in cases where it just keeps getting extreme and extreme, I've seen cases where um, them coming out and saying, hey, look, this is what's going on. I mean, in a case where they're not getting their presence and uh, they're being told, hey, they're not sending you anything on the holidays. They're not trying to call you. They're not doing anything. Do we just sit there and allow that uh, lie to be told? Um, you know, so it's it's kind of a slippery slope, but I think the, the kids need to know. But just make sure that when you're talking to them, even though that you know uh, mom or dad, whoever's doing these tricks, are, are playing this, there's an innocent heart sitting right there, and they love both of you, okay? Yeah. And you, the, the thing you got to protect is, is them. And so we got to we got to detach ourselves from it. And that's our job as parents is to do the best that we can for our kids. So be be very careful with that. But um, in instances, you know, you're probably going to have to do what you got to do. It's, it's in how you do it. I'd say you got to be mindful of. Um, so the second part was how do you get a lawyer to see parental alienation? I know you and uh, uh, Melissa have talked about this a lot. So what, what advice would you have for that? You know, um, I'm going to be as blunt as I can on this one. And guys, excuse me if, if it's a little too blunt, but if how to get your lawyer to see parental alienation, if they can't see it for themselves, you need a new lawyer. Yep, <laughs> I would agree with you. That's it. If, you're, if you've got to prove to your lawyer uh, what they need to know about your case, then you're paying money to somebody that isn't worth the crap. So. Well, what I would just add on to that is if you're talking, when, you, when you're talking with your attorney and one, don't go in there saying, you know, I've diagnosed my ex with an, you know, NPD and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> tell them the story, tell them what's going on, tell them the pattern of behavior. And hopefully they'll say something like, wow, it sounds like you're dealing with a narcissist or it sounds like there might be parental alienation going on. You know, let them tell you what you already know instead of you trying to tell them. And just that's where, you know, I think a lot of times when you have someone who understands, then you have somebody who knows how to deal in these situations and knows how complicated they are, too. Yeah, definitely. And, and in that case, you know, they've got to hear the story, um, tell them the story. And if they pick up on that, then, you know, good. But if, like I said, if you're having to walk them through every step to kind of show them and, you know, just give them the story the best that you know how to don't, 
you know, again, yeah. it's emotionally charged, uh, you know, try to keep the feelings out of it, give them what they need so they can go in there and properly defend you. But, uh, I, you know, Dwayne, the sad thing is I've, I've talked to attorneys is like, I've never seen a case of parental alienation. I'm like, you've yeah. got to be kidding me. Um, you know, so- honestly though, Eric, I think some of those people probably aren't lying because I really don't think that, you know, 50 to 80% of divorces are all high conflict, nasty messes. I don't, I think we're a subset. I mean, we're a really bad subset, but I don't think it's as, as common. And I think what happens is you have these attorneys who, who don't deal with it, right? They're dealing with the normal people. They're able to, to cooperate. They do, you know, yeah, they, they throw mud around a little bit, but then they calm down. And then if they're dealing with somebody who is completely narcissistic and high conflict, they don't know how to deal with it because they've never dealt with it. I've had actually, I've had some uh, uh, attorneys talk to me that said, um, I've never, I mean, I didn't even, I mean, I now I had a client who whose ex was this way or the client was this way, but I hadn't seen it until recently. So I don't think it happens as often as we think. You know what I mean? Um, I, I know what you're saying in a sec, but you know, I, I can't agree. I, I think okay. uh, more of these cases got alienation than you could ever imagine. I, you know, even in a case where a father is only getting 15 to 20 percent of the time, yeah. Uh, you know, even if they in, end up finally ended up agreeing, there's there's some level of alienation going on there. If you have to take your ex to court for them yeah. to allow you to see your children, alienation's already happening. Right, right. So most no, of those cases I agree go into you. family court. You know, I've seen cases where, you know, mom and dad just come together and it was so smooth. And I can't tell you how jealous I am of that. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, I hear you on that. How one. did you get that? I wish that uh, that I could have experienced that. And I'm, I've seen a good bit of those. But for the most part, man, once the family courts get in there and get those lawyers and everything yeah. else ramped up, they need that conflict. And if there isn't conflict, they'll make it. Um, Netflix, the marriage story, that's probably one of the most accurate portrayals I've ever seen of what happens in family court. They, Two people that was getting along, they was going to do everything right down the line. Mom goes and talks to a lawyer. Uh, you need child support. You need this. You need this. And all of a sudden, two people that were doing it the right way yeah. become bitter enemies. And oh, yeah. uh, it's became all, all too common a, a scenario. I think people could get along a lot better if the courts was out of it. Absolutely. So the last yeah. part of that, and I, and I just have to say my phone lines lit up. So every line right now has a caller in it. So we'll All hit right. this last one and then we'll start t- picking some of the callers. So people who are on hold, uh, stand by. Um, we'll go to line four in a minute. But the last question was how to know when to back down and trust that the ex will be cooperative versus sticking to your guns. Oh, that's a rough one. And I did see that, uh, Maconia. Um, mm, I think, you know, when that time comes, you know, I've heard a lot of these guys just say, I can't do it anymore. I'm, I'm done. I'm walking away. And, you know, at, at first it's like, how can you give up on your kids before I got involved in this? How could you get up and you know, give up on your kids? How could you do that? Uh, after experiencing it and seeing some of the situations that people are going through, I understand why some people walk away. Um, you know, versus, uh, I guess that could be in, asked in what way are you meaning that in which way do we stick to our guns um you know one of the best ways that i think we can promote co-parenting show some give and take like i was saying earlier uh if you want to have a situation maybe it's starting to get a little contentious it's getting a little out of hand say hey you know would would you me somewhere just me and you um let's come together let's let's parent our child i'll let you pick a place i'll let you pick a time you 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 say where it's at and, and i'll be there That might not seem like such a big deal, but you're saying, hey, I'm giving you control. I'm letting you pick it. I'm saying this and I'm going to abide by it. So right there, you've already showed a little bit of grace and and vulnerability. Now, at that point in time, um, and, you know, always make sure you're keeping it about your kids. If that doesn't work, well, you at least tried. Right. And then I'd say stick to your guns. But uh, try try some of those other things before. I'm just saying I got to I got to walk away from it. But I I know you said you got some calls. If you don't mind, I'm going to walk right over here and turn down my AC, man. It's done got hot here in Georgia. Yeah, no worries. Stand by. (laughs) Be right back. So I'll wait to pull on pull on the caller. But what I will add on to that is, you know, a lot of times we have to test to see what we're really dealing with. So if you have somebody who you you want to see and you're and you're like, okay, so do I stick with my guns or do I try to compromise? Throw something out there and see what happens. 
like what Eric was talking about. I mean, I tried that a couple of times. And uh, as soon as it got to the point where it's like, okay, if I'm around this person, false allegations are going to happen. I stopped doing it. But, but I had to have some incidents to prove to me that I couldn't trust this person. So once you get to the point where you're like, okay, I see what's going on and I've tried, like Eric was talking about, then, you know, then you can, you can move on with that. So, um, all right, I'm going to go to the next line, line number four. Hello and welcome to the show. Hey, good evening. My name's Chris. Hey, um, hey Chris, how you doing? I called in, I actually, hey, great. Hey, thanks so much, Eric. I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I'd like to just make a couple comments, um, uh, especially with Eric stating, you know, bring on some celebrities, get some people involved. Well, I think Eric's probably one of the best celebrities we can bring on. We've got a person that's a man of faith that was the preacher's uh, son. And I think it's people like me that's not a celebrity that can call in and give testimony as to concerns as to what's going on out there. Um, a key statement that I wrote down earlier, parental alienation is very dangerous. And it is. I'm very concerned for my children. Um, during litigation, my daughter was diagnosed as SI due to divorce. Mm. And um, when you find out you got a child that's suicidal because of a high contingency divorce, something has to be done. Suicide is dangerous. It takes the lives of many parents, mothers and fathers. And when there's something out there so designed to use your children to put you into a conflict situation that becomes so dire that you take your life, it needs to be treated like hazing is treated in high schools where somebody takes their life over being hazed. It needs to be treated like the bullying that occurs where somebody takes their lives. And it needs to be taken more serious. And the instigators and the contributors need to be held accountable. If they know they're creating child custody conflict, which is going to hurt a child and it's going to hurt a father, Somebody needs to step in. That's what I'd like to say. Um, I've been through a jury dependency and neglect case where I've been proven innocent. Um, that happened to follow after my former spouse filed for divorce. <sighs> Following that, after a time period, I went through modification of parenting time, which the allegations were repeated and it succeeded that time. And I haven't seen a 13-year-old daughter now for two years. The same one that's been diagnosed as suicide due to divorce. And I haven't seen two younger children, a son and a daughter, for approximately three months now. I'm forced into supervised visits. The supervised visits fail for one reason or another. None of it of my fault or my children's fault. And this is worst case scenario for a parent. And again, if it was a high school situation where there was bullying involved, the bullying and the little gang, if this was a gang member causing antagonization by driving by and yelling allegations and slashing guns and, and things like that, a government would shut them down. But some reason it's allowable in families with your own children and this has got to stop and i appreciate what you're doing eric hey thank you man um i am i'm so sorry to hear what you're going through i, I really am um you know keep your head up brother and uh you know we're, we're gonna try to get this out there as good as we as good as we can and uh you know just hearing hearing from people like you and knowing that, you know, this is going on, it, it lets us know that what we're doing counts. Thank you very much. And I think that hearing people's stories and true stories and exactly as it's occurring, you know, if John Mass wouldn't have called in and told you prior 
what was going on, there really wouldn't be a story here. Yeah. People have got to speak up and they've got to understand that when a child goes in front of a professional and we've got this whole nationwide, Oh, we've got huge mental health problems and it's COVID COVID-19. Well, wait a minute. Is it all COVID-19? Well, the divorce rate's higher with COVID-19 because people are spending time together at home and not getting along. Okay. Well, what's the follow there? Well, now we've got children in divorce and high custody conflict situations. Yeah. You know, somebody's got to do what's known as root cause analysis. Yeah. And to find those mental health pinpoints as to what is really causing the mental health breakdown in our children these days and what percentage of it is divorce and high cost, high conflict custody where a child is actually diagnosed as SI due to divorce. Divorce is the severance between a husband and a wife, not a severance of a child causing mental health crisis of potential suicide. You know, a good question would be, how many suicides of a child fall behind a high conflict custody case? That puts parent alienation and child custody conflict into the quote earlier, parental alienation is very dangerous. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thanks for calling. You know, uh, Dwayne, one of the things I, I meant to say to the, the caller before, you know, um, that the first time, you know, he's right. There needs to be some type of um, responsibility, accountability. you know, for the people that are made. Yeah, uh, accountability, <laughs> um, consequences for some of these ruins that we're seeing, even in the John Mass case. Here was a guy that had evidence and the judge didn't allow the evidence. Now a new judge comes on, allows evidence, and it completely changes the outcome. Yeah. When we get a when we get something that wrong, uh, this judicial immunity is one of the most dangerous things that I've ever seen. And there there definitely needs to be some more consequences. So I, I agree with him. Absolutely. Uh, I agree with him. 100%. Yeah. And I mean and and I don't think see, you know the the messed up part about this is an alienating parent is so hell bent on winning yep. that pushing their own child to the brink of, of making a catastrophic life choice. I would imagine to them, it's probably a victory because they're in their mind, because they're blaming it on the caller. And it's like anybody else would say, Oh my God, I got to stop this. This is, this has gone too far. This is wrong. But these people don't effing care. And, and you're right. And what the caller was saying is absolutely right. There has to be accountability. And unfortunately, or not, I guess fortunately, is what, Eric, what you're doing is starting to draw. You're, you're bringing attention to this in a way that people are listening to it and acknowledging it and not sweeping it under the rug. Right. I mean, you're at the early stages. I know you wish you were farther. I mean, hell, we all wish that this is, yeah. you know, you could just knock this over, you know get a home run and you know next week we could be talking about all the success that's happened um, you are getting success but it's going to take time for for this to get out there and i really feel for that caller that that's just i, I mean, do too that's horrible um you know, any you know. other comment you want to hit before i go to the next the next caller you know one of the first cases when, uh, when we first started that really just went bananas uh you know this it was it was kind of like john asked there was a father up in Michigan whose son was born with hydrocephalus water on the brain he was a year and a half old mom was on drugs uh, she would leave him at periods of time with nobody to watch him there was all kinds of bad situations going on and this father took her to court and looked straight at the judge and said if you do not give me custody of my son my son is going to die judge said I'm not taking custody away from a mom not doing it and uh, just completely didn't listen to him two weeks later the baby boy died after after the father told her plainly after his son died he obviously he had a lot of emotions going on yeah. he went to social media and said look this i told her this is what was going to happen they locked him in jail uh, the judge put him in jail after that for for speaking out about that case and uh, they tried to give him a plea deal in uh, hopes that he would shut up and he said look i've done lost my son i've got nothing yeah, to lose I got nothing I'm, I'm not playing and uh when he took her to court he beat her 
He beat well, that it's, judge. It's, it's a freedom of speech. He can say whatever the hell he wants. Some people forget that we're still in the United States of America. But how do you make a judgment like that that has such a severe consequence and there's nothing done? I mean, he it's horrible. told her, uh, how do you not look at evidence for John that can completely destroy his life? All you, It's going to take yeah. you a couple of minutes to look at this evidence. Uh, yeah, there yeah. needs to be some accountability. I, and have a recess or reschedule until you have the right technology to do it, but not not say, no, I'm not going to look at it. That's it. I mean, yeah, those I little you, things man. that you're doing are completely destroying people's lives. People, um, yeah, absolutely. All right, let me go to the next caller. Let me get it set up here. Hello, and welcome to the show. Hello, hi. Good evening. How are you? Doing good. How are you doing tonight? Hey, man. Pretty good, Dwayne. Uh, uh, I want to thank you, and I want to thank your guest. Uh, also, uh, the prior caller. My brother, I can call him my brother because uh, I don't know his name. I don't know who it is, but I definitely uh, can relate. And you know, everything that he say, um, English is my second language, and I definitely, he say everything that I wanted to say, but in some circumstances, um, I definitely, uh, uh, um, almost have the same thing. It's, it's exactly different, you know, I mean, not with the suicidal, but uh, with the situation with my kids, uh, being so young and going through this hospital. And uh, um, my question is, well, actually, uh, I guess, uh, I, I mean, like you were saying that, I also, uh, I beat the case that she falsely, 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 falsely accused me of, uh, of something that the, cho- the judge uh, saw uh, her evidence. And then I proved my evidence. Um, and she ended up, wanted to say that it was something physically of my body that the reason why when she was a user, uh, she looked bad in front of the judge and that's why she lost the case. I didn't want to proceed it, but that was a diff- I think I spoke to you a long time ago. And it's like, it, 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 feels, it felt good that the judge was able to, to in, this, in my case, in my situation was that I strong proof of my evidence that I was a user. I mean, I was I was being abused. Yeah, but yeah. when she proved when she proved her case, when she proved her case, um, she didn't have no police report. She did everything wrong. Um, so my question to you guys is this: uh, So once the police report is made, that's the evidence that we get screwed automatically, regardless. Uh, yes, I think that it's got a lot to do with the Violence Against Women's Act. <laughs> um, Ask no questions. You're if they make the accusation, you're you're guilty. So, so when so we my case was that she left with my kids to another county, and I talked to Wayne that it's it being so crazy. And um, uh, they, they, when the cops showed up to to my to my apartment, he was like, "What's going on? I don't know." She took off with my kids. So now when I see the caller, that you know uh, they don't want to see our evidence that awful men. We are abused, and we take that abuse. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. It's amazing that it's amazing that you know. It's amazing. I, I just want to say real brief. I, I just want to. I just want to be brief. Um, it's amazing that when I proved what she did to me the same day that she was putting her her evidence on a video, she ended up saying that the reason why I had the the bloody eye was uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, psoriasis, and. Yeah. and the judge didn't believe her. And it's like, it, 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 uh, it was, we were laughing about it. And it's like, we did the case. Um, she lost it. And, and now it's like, the, the king just, the, the king have enough because, you know, they're always looking for, for an excuse to to prove that, that they're always, I mean, I, was, wow, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, I would say it was a victory, but at the same time, it was like, what happened if I would have never had, if I would have never took a picture of when she did that to me at yeah. that same time? The judge, the, he, they look at the time that she reported it, they look at the time that the picture was taken when I took it, and the judge didn't want to believe it, and it was like victory. So it was false accusation. Second, second, real quick, because I know you have another caller. Uh, I, I know I, I, I got in late and the testimony of the prior caller, I just want to, I want to praise him to keep on and don't forget the faith on the Lord. Uh, 
I definitely don't know your name, my friend. If you listen to me, to me, uh, I'm a brother also. The I'm a father also. The is going through a lot, and I I, I want to support you. I want to encourage you to don't don't give up for your daughter. Don't give up for your kids. And um, and my second, my last question is to you guys, real quick. Um, so now I'm going to the mediation. Mediation now that I, we next month. My judge, my lawyer, he's uh, pressured me to get all the papers. I got him, but I have a I have a question. I have um, a prior, I have a case of another of a uh, a settlement that I have of an injury that I have on my prior job. Uh, how do you recommend going through this? Wait until the case is over, because I'm being pressured to settle in this case. Once I do the mediation for something that I don't want her to know that I have this case that they're going to give me money for. You're talking about like a workers' comp settlement? Yes, yes. Uh, Ooh. Well, what I would say on that, man, is uh, if you don't mind, I'll just chime in. And then, you know, Eric, if you have something after that, is. Y- y- if, because I've talked to a few people who have these pending things, right? It's like either a business deal or a settlement like this or, or whatever. It, until it's done, it doesn't necessarily exist. And, and God only knows whenever that thing might actually go. I mean, so, um, you know, I mean, you don't, right now, there's no number. There's no, they're not saying they're going to send you $10 or $10 million. I mean, so uh, I would kind of treat it as if it's irrelevant right now until it actually happens. Because if you throw it out there, no, then the lawyers. My, that, that, what was? Go ahead. No, that no, the attorney already told me that I got ten days to decide when he's going to throw the case because they already went to settle, and I was waiting for me to get divorced because in the state that I am, you have to wait a year. Right. But, you know, you're not living with the person, and we we don't have yet a year, so I got ten days to decide if I want to settle or he's going to throw, drop the case. Drop the drop the the, 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 the case for the work or the case for your mediation yeah. for your divorce. For the workers comp. No, for the workers, for the workers comp. comp. Oh crap. Oh, uh, no. So so my case is in next month, and um, so I'm trying to uh, like you know, push it back. You know what, because, man? You, know, uh, you need not, to not, you need to not, double check with your with your family law attorney because, like, in certain areas, like in California, um, certain things are off the off t- off the off. Uh, don't count, right? So like if you get a an inheritance, that doesn't count. Um, if you guys are separated and you get a big chunk of change, that's probably not going to be considered hers. So, but you, but you need to double check with your family law attorney on what the laws in your state and area are to, to really answer that question. I'd, I'd uh, yeah, echo sure. those sentiments from you, Dwayne, but at the same time, uh, with that workers' comp settlement, if they've gave you a deadline, you, you don't want to go past it because yeah, they to. they don't want to pay you. So um, yeah. if if you go past it, that's uh, no return. Yeah. So if you're in that situation, don't and and your attorney is saying, hey, if you if you don't press the button, I'm going to walk away and this is going to fall apart. Don't do that to yourself, man. No, exactly. So one one real quick question at the end is that if I because you know. We would tell you can divorce, get divorced uh, until January next year. But uh, yeah, I mean, everything is going. I just want to put it under the name of uh, my kids. Now, right now, we have 50 50. Uh, and I'm unemployed. And now, the attorney that I hire, I pay when I was working. But now that if I show him and prove, and I told him about this situation, now he's going to throw me a bigger bill than what it is. For my case, the, uh, it, it, I spent so much money in the other county. So, uh, why, I mean, uh, are they able to discover that there's a workers' count in the process? If I settle ten days, like counting not right now, and my my uh, my uh, mediation is in next month. Well, I mean, the only thing, one thing, I'll just say because you're you're asking some really specific questions. Neither Eric or I are attorneys. I mean, and, and 
we got to be really careful on what we say because we don't necessarily want to be giving you legal advice. Okay. You, okay. you you really need to. I mean, I think what you're saying. I mean, actually, I don't even want it, to. It, it's very complex. Um, what I would recommend probably with what you're doing is maybe what you should do is do a consult with a new attorney because it sounds like you have some specific questions and ask, ask it from somebody who's neutral, go and pay. I mean, even some areas, okay. you know, maybe it'll cost you a hundred bucks to do an hour uh, consult and you could sit there and say, Hey, here's my situation. This is what I'm looking at. This is what I'm concerned about. Am I okay if I do this, this, and this, and then that way you'd have a better legal uh, opinion on what, what's going on. But really for either Eric and I, it's, it's kind of a gray area that we, we got to be careful about. Uh, okay, Dwayne, okay, if perfect, I could. Perfect, uh, yeah, go ahead, Eric. Um, caller, uh, on my show, I have a show I do every other week with an attorney um, where people can write in their questions and get, you know, free yeah. legal, legal answers. Uh, if you call his office and tell him that you heard about that through dad talk, he'll give you a free consultation. So, that might be something okay. that you could look into just to get that second opinion. I, I like us. I'd echo what Wayne's saying. If it, if it seems like you're afraid that, uh, you know, if he knows you got money that you're just going to keep getting billed. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good concern for you to have because yep. we have seen that, um, yep. you know, get you a second okay. opinion, man. Get you a second opinion. Okay. Right, right on brother. Thank you. Good All luck, hey, man. Good All right, buddy. Good night. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see here. We got a couple of more call. Are you, are, do you still got time? I know we're coming up on two hours. Are you okay? Or are you running out of time? Yeah, we're good, man. I, I, I'd like to touch on a, a comment here. You know, yeah, absolutely. Which one? I'll see if I can pull it up. Who was trying it from? to come? Uh, I think it was merge music and film. It might've been, um, but talking about, you know, how like uh, trying to come together and co-parent with the, the ex and get in, you know, a situation where you give them a little bit of grace, I'll give a little bit of give and take. It's like, oh, you can't do that. You're, you're inviting them into the lines again. Yeah, I'll call, keep I'll in call mind, I just guys, popped that up on screen. Yeah. Keep in mind, guys, not every situation was as bad as what you're seeing here, right? Some of these yeah. situations could be completely solved with just a, a normal conversation and both of them checking their their uh, situation and saying, hey, let's let's put this down and talk. I've seen that happen in a but lot see, of cases. But Eric, what I you're talking what you're talking about is you're talking about early in the process, everything's going crazy, taking yeah. one moment and saying, hey, let's sit down and talk. And if that turns yeah. into a catastrophe, if that turns into a total Charlie Foxtrot, then you know. Then you know. Then you, then know, then you know, that, know Then what Merge was saying. You've, you've done it. You've tried. Don't put yourself in, you know, don't, don't uh, walk into the viper den because you're going to get eaten alive. I, and, that's, and that's what that's you're it. saying. I mean, that's not, you're not yes. saying, Hey, you've had a year of experience that your <laughs> ex will cut your throat the first chance they get. Why don't you just go ahead and say, Hey honey, let's go meet in a dark alley with no cameras, with no witnesses. And let's, let's have a conversation. Right. I mean, that's not what you're saying. If I was saying that I wouldn't be sitting <laughs> in the chair situation. Okay? Exactly. All right. But some of these guys have situations where that one conversation could probably change things. Just try. Dude, and if it doesn't I, work, you know, like I'll tell you, man, it. I tried. I, there were, there I were a too. handful of times where I'm like, you know, every once in a while it was like, you know, the X would be a little nice. I'm like, Oh, thank God. This is finally going to stop. And I would put my guard down and all that would happen is she'd take her bony little finger and go boop right in my eye. And I'd be like, Oh crap. You know, I mean, right. and, and I hate to say this, man, it took me about three or four times of that to happen before I finally said, oh, well, there, there's, a, there's a trend and a pattern here. I, I, I need to start paying attention to that before I end up in jail or something. So You ain't kidding, man. Early on, you know, I didn't know what parental alienation was. I didn't know what gaslighting was. Not until after I had experienced it for a while and oh, started yeah. looking it up. I used yeah. to let it get to me bad. I mean, and I'd go right back trying to, you know, go do the back and forth. And eventually you just realize you're, you're hitting a dead end. This is a yep. person that you're not going to be able to do that with. And you're not going to participate anymore. If it, if it doesn't have something to do with my kid, I'm not talking to you, but, uh, not every case is that case. Yeah. And so that's why I would say if you tried that and you're ending up in a situation, kind of like what me and Dwayne are talking about, you did what you did. Yeah, and you did it. You tried all, all you're, you're saying is just try once. Try it. Yeah, yep. that's, I get it. And I agree with you. I agree with you on that. All right, let me go to the next caller. Uh, let me turn the line on. Hello, and welcome to the show. Hello. How you doing? You are I'm on good. live. 
<laughs> yeah. So I'm kind of going through a situation where, um, when I immediately started realizing what was happening as far as, you know, the spouse and whatever, um, it was more on like a mother-in-law. My mother-in-law was the one who was kind of doing it, but I immediately got my son evaluated and just to prove that there was emotional abuse going on. He was seven. He was showing major signs of PTSD, unsure of himself, didn't want to go in rooms alone. And he, he would say that he only felt like this at home. He'd like to be away from home because he didn't feel like that. So I immediately got him evaluated. It showed symptoms. Um, and then I got a PRE instead of a CFI to come in. And basically what what they did was, I mean, they did it all around. <laughs> they came in my house and they talked to every, and I mean, days of interviews. Not just come in for a little while and see how you interact with the kids. They hung out and they talked to every single adult who was going to be living in this house, who was going to have anything to do with any type of seeing anybody of the kids. And they did major, major interviews. Well, on the other, on my other half, there was a relationship between her and her mom that wasn't right. And, and there were definitely signs of, you know, there wasn't, that, that wasn't healthy. And they really couldn't hide it. Um, because they didn't know that. Because you know how you know toxic people don't really. They sometimes think that they're okay. You know, like that it's that the way it is, and right. and that's fine. But um, once they realized that, like, hey, you know, grandma's telling, you know, grandson, um, you can only you're not allowed to cry unless you're bleeding, and then turning around and buying him gifts every day, and then telling him. Uh, don't tell your dad you bought this and teaching, you know, pretty much, pretty much being very divisive and teaching my yeah. kids how, how to lie to his parents, you know? Yeah. And um, they saw that and the reports went out, but we haven't gone through the actual court custody battle part of it. And, and it, it, I hear all these, all these <laughs> sad stories or, or horror stories of, you know, like we just don't have the same rights that we have. Right. Um, and I, I'm getting nervous. I'm getting nervous about what's coming up. And I just like, don't want, I just don't want to be like, like, like some of the other callers ha have said, this just completely disappointed. Like, like, are you kidding me? Like it's proven that it's happening. It's proven that it's hurting kids. It's proven who's doing it and where it's taking place. And yet, have you seen the final you know, report of what the evaluators have said? I mean, have the, are the evaluators documenting what they're seeing in that other house? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So they, so they documented several different things that were not appropriate and that were, were causing or that, that brought, that raised issues, um, some statements. And then the way... But this, this, this evaluator was court-ordered, right? I mean, so you went through the process and... Well, and where did is, is, so there's, a, there's a PRE and then there's a CFI. What's a PRE? I'm not familiar with that. Neither. What, what is it's PRE? Like, it's basically like so it's a file where, where a counselor comes in, no no more knowledge than a high school counselor comes in, you spend two hours with him and your kid, and then he'll go to the mom's okay. side, spend two hours. Yeah, that's like in California, they call PRE. it a custody of a 730 custody evaluation where. A mental health professional does that. They evaluate both parties. They observe yeah. and stuff like that. So, okay. It's just different states call yeah. it different things. Sorry, I, I hadn't heard. No, it's not. It's fine. So, yeah. so, so uh, what I would. The you, reason why I, okay, go ahead. So this is what happened. She, I'm sorry. She asked for full custody. Of course. Uh, mandatory or full custody, supervised visitation. Because she asked for full custody, she couldn't deny a PRE by law. Good. I was able to bring one in. And she couldn't deny. It. So there were some things that were brought up. Um, the way they, that she is with her mom, um, things that were said. Um, she calls my daughter's three, and she goes, "So they refer to each other as best friends." Well, you know, like my daughter doesn't need a best friend; she needs a mom, you know. Right, and yeah. and um, she saw the, the manipulation between her, my mother-in-law, and the rest of the family, and because she's. She's the toxic one. She's the one who's feeding off all of it. Right. Um, once I realized what was going on, um, and I spent 10 years in the Marine Corps, so I ran my mouth and immediately was jettisoned from, you know, the relationship and went from there. But it was right. all her mom. There was no okay. beginning of where my wife 
ended and where my mother-in-law began. And the report is, the report, da- it's pretty damaging to them. Okay. Um, Do you have a specific question? Well, I was just wondering. Because like, I, I have some thoughts on it, but I want to make sure that we're covering what you want to hear or what your specific issue is. Yeah. I was just wondering if there was anybody else out there who's been in my situation that they had a PRE as opposed to a CFI. And, and did, did you guys do that or did you not hear about it? Um, were you able to? Because there wasn't a whole lot of physical abuse going on with my children. It's been going on so long with my seven-year-old that he was almost in in psychosis. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. So... Um, it, it's been hard for me to prove, hey, this is what's going on. Because I had no idea. I never heard of gaslighting. I never heard of, yeah. I didn't even know what a narcissist was until a week after I was, you know, pretty much jettisoned from the entire situation. And, and I kind of really didn't, I hear a lot of people say, don't do this, don't do that, don't say this, don't mention that. Well, I kept a calm, cool head about myself because I yeah. do. Whoever's got the coolest head is the one that's going to come out on top. But I ran, I spoke out. I ran my mouth about what was going on, um, what I thought was going on. I, you know, I said, I'm not a doctor, but I see this, 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 and this, and that ain't right. And I guess I, maybe I had some help because I found a counselor. And then she found me a lawyer. Okay. And this lawyer is amazing and they've all kind of dealt with it before and then my counselor kind of had some strategy on when and where and how to do it at what time to do the process and it's helped out a lot like i kind of call on my panel yeah i have a panel of people that are here to help me and it's not over but i I, like i mean i I, there's been several times where i've looked at my mother-in-law and said if you think that i'm ever going to leave my kids here with you you've lost your mind and that's honestly how I feel. There's no way that I'll ever leave my kids in that house with her ever. No, I see. Yeah. I, it's a generational thing going on there. Yeah. So, right. I mean, well, I guess I, that's just kind of what I was asking. No, no, kids. that's fine. Do you, Eric, do you want any clarification before I let him go? And then we'll, then we'll just, address it. What was, what was he meaning by CFI? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that one is probably something else <laughs> yeah what's the cfi stand for um, probably like what so uh like protective uh, services or something for, for, yeah custody, no, that's why i think custody formal investigator or something like that and that's the cheaper one that's the one who's basically like see uh, has well, counseling school and that's about it okay i don't think you, i mean for, for my area and eric's area we don't use those terms so we're not completely familiar with it but what yeah. i would say and I'll just jump in and then Eric, you can, you can, what I would say is the fact that you have a therapist who's targeted in with and understands what you're dealing with, who then recommended an attorney who understands these things and knows how to deal with it. And they're helping you build a strategy. And it sounds like in some instances, you may not be following exactly what they want you to do, but that's fine. And now you have this evaluation that's documenting the problems you've done. You're doing good and you need to be really careful about grabbing, you know, to feed out of the hands of victory. And I've, I've personally coached people where they're kind of where you are, caller, where they're just, they're kind of freaking out. They think like they're, they're losing. And when I deep dive more into the details, it's like, wait a minute, a lot of the nuances show that you're in the right path. I mean, I know in a nine minute phone call, we can't get all the details, but it really sounds like you have a strategy that's working. It's identifying what it is. You need to be a little more careful of how you interact with your ex and the mother-in-law just so you don't create an extra p- a problem because narcissistic yeah. high-conflict people have a unique skill of cherry-picking incidences to try to blow something out, to try to, to de- basically defer or to make everyone look at the wrong place. And so you got to be careful you don't hand them a- ammunition to do that. But other than that, it sounds like you're really on track. And she definitely did do that. Yeah. She definitely I, did do that. I, oh, before. of course. They all do. And I, I'd, I'd agree yeah. with you, Dwayne. I mean, uh, the only stories I've ever heard of custody evaluators are usually nightmares and a big bill at the end. So the fact that you had a custody evaluator that sounds like they did what they was actually supposed to do. It was seven grand. It was seven grand. Yeah, they're not up. cheap. They are not cheap. Seven grand. 
I, this, no. this is going to sound crazy, no. but that's I cheap think, compared to most of the ones that I hear. Yeah, true. That is, yeah, like yeah, I know a guy that was paying were 25 were a pop. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah. Well, but, I mean, but, but caller, I think the benefit I, I, you have is you, like you just said, I can't remember what the term you call, but your, your support staff, your entourage, you have professionals in your, in your side that understand what's going on and, and are helping you build a case or, or build a story. I don't, I don't want to say case. They're building a narrative and a, and, and a story that they can demonstrate to the court to, to, to shine a light in this. So, you know, a lot of times we don't get that, you know, so you're, you're fortunate yeah. that that you've had an opportunity to, to get some people in your corner that are really, are really working for you is what it sounds like to me. Well, yeah. and, I, and I kind of feel like I've, I've, I've pursued that because I haven't necessarily like, been, I hear so much, oh, don't say that. Don't mention this. Don't mention how you feel like this. And I was like, hell no. She abused me and, she, and she's abusing our, our children now. Yeah, like, it, it, no. like, I understand why people are saying and, that. I mean, and Eric and I, I mean, even throughout this, I mean, it, you just have to be careful how you do things because it's, it's okay. For instance, if you've watched my channel before, and I'm not sure if you have, I typically talk about things in yeah, the, I is, okay, then you probably heard me talk about battles and wars, right? You can win a battle yes. and you can lose the war. So you're winning battles and you're risking the war and your attorney and other people are telling you not to do that because they're trying to make sure that you limit your exposure. Now, here's the reality, exactly. but this is what I'll tell you, man. And, and I know where you're at. Just, just hold on a second. Let me just finish this thought. Cause I want you to hear this. What people don't understand going through this is the emotional toll that this has on you. And sometimes you can't stop yourself from doing it because you're so angry and frustrated about the unfairness of it all that you feel like you have to do something. I get it. I've done it myself. I don't know if Eric, maybe Eric's done it too. But what you have to do is you have to realize that a lot of times those, those outbursts don't serve the long-term goal. I've made my mistake on that. I'm not trying to pass judgment on you or anything like that. I understand it. And a lot of people, when they tell you that they don't, they, they miss the part about how emotionally stressful and draining this is. And sometimes it's a huge ass to say, Hey, look, don't show your ass to your, to, uh, to the mother-in-law. Right. But, but that, but the reason people are saying that is because they're trying to make sure that you have the best possible scenario going forward. So just, I, I hope that was helpful. That's all your news. And honestly, I just want to say thank you because in my situation, it's so bad like that because the mother-in-law, she'll hoover me. And when it happens, I, I watch, I get on my phone and I watch a video from you. <laughs> and <laughs> Good. seriously, that's, that's my routine now is, is she'll hoover me and she'll do anything from show her face in a, in a face chat with my kids with, with a big grin yeah. or whatever or anything. And I, before I do anything, I like sit down. Like I, I need, I go. I need to watch the narcissist video. And I, <laughs> I sit down, I watch yours, and it, it gives me that half an hour period, and I don't even respond. Yeah. And that that seriously is kind of what got me through it is is your videos, your recommendations, and just the process that you've gone through, and the relation with mine is is what's really gotten me through this. And I just want to say thank you. And I appreciate it a lot because, I mean, we all know how in-laws can be. And yeah. for me, it was bad because she would take, and I would take it out on my wine. Oh, yeah. So she automatically is innocent. She's innocent automatically. Yeah. You know, and it, it, was, mm -hmm. it was just a, 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 a bait catch. And you really helped me out in, in this whole process. I just want to say thank you. Yeah, absolutely, man. All right. Well, thanks for the call. Eric, you want to drop uh, anything you want to add on that? As I boop, <laughs> man, yeah, they are like, they are amazing at at, I, at uh, pushing the buttons, huh? Oh, have you seen me do that before? I do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I stole your gimmick. Uh, <laughs> but no, man, I agreed with everything you said. Don't give them anything that they can throw back. I mean, in his case, it sounds like the people that he's got hired on is actually doing the right thing, which is yeah. extremely rare. Don't yeah. mess that up. You know, uh, if there's there's going to be any contention or anything going on let it happen on the other side you sit there keep your nose clean watch how you respond keep the emotions cool there's going to be times that the, the buttons are going to be pressed but you know sit back breathe come watch Dwayne like he was just mentioning um 
You know, sometimes it takes us getting a l- little bit further down the line to get a, a little bit more detached away from those emotions. But I mean, so far from what I hear, it seems like your people are trying to steer you straight, man. Listen to them. Um, that's situation sounds good to me. Yeah. And I think that the, the really tough part about this, and I've seen this a lot with people from my channel and even some people I've coached, is that there's so many people that are around you just telling you that it's going to be horrible. You're not going to win. Oh, you think you're yeah. going to win, but you're going to lose. And, you know, OK, you might have some you might have some setbacks. What are the only thing I would say on that is if, if something goes wrong and, you know, your information is ignored or the evidence is ignored, f- appeal it. Don't just, you know, don't just sit there and uh, um, ac- accept it. I mean, you know, uh, it can be devastating, but there is a process. Uh, I, I mean, if if the, if the guy's been watching me, he's probably heard me talk about Alex Falcone. But anybody who's trying to do uh, to deal with the legal side of this, Alex um, on the proper person has a tremendous amount of information uh, to talk about representing yourself in the family court process. Um, before I go to the, I got two callers left. Anything okay. you want to hit before we go to the next one? Yeah. So the the past couple callers that you had call in was talking about being abused physically. And that's that's a very big problem, Dwayne. Um, you know, I had a guy on that gave the updated statistics the other day that said last year domestic violence happened to 3.5 million women versus 4.2 million men. Uh, but you never wow. see a man on a billboard. You do not see any men's domestic violence shelters. Guys, you got to start speaking up. I think uh, we've been told that you need to just get over it, man up, uh, don't talk about it, stop whining. Uh, That's where toxic masculinity comes in because you're telling somebody that's went through a bad situation not to talk about it or just get over it. Um, Guys, you got to speak. The world can't hear what you don't say. I take that from Dr. Warren Farrell. They they can't. And if we don't speak up and say, hey, I've been through this too, um, we're just going to keep going through this. This is very common. Look at the Johnny Depp situation. Um, It was said that it was one way. He got the tape. Amber's actually saying, "Uh, Johnny, it was... You know, it was the other way around. And, uh, you know, yeah. we're just not looked at as people that this can happen to. It's it, it's more well, common that you guys are experiencing yeah. this. But if you don't speak about it, then it holds no weight. Well, and half the time, if somebody is in a physical altercation and it's and it's female on male, you know, I mean, society tells you to suck it up. You know, I mean, and yeah. the problem is, is if you, if you suck it up, then there's no evidence of it. There's no report of it. There's no history of it. And now whenever the person makes an allegation against you, you know, they made an, you know, that's in the, that's in the system, you know I mean? So you have to, it's tough, right? I mean, it's, it's tough, especially as a man to, uh, to, I mean, I, well, I'll just say, you know, it takes somebody like me, you know, 6'2", 280 pounds. You know, my ex was, you know, 5'3", 100 pounds. I mean, y- if you look at that scenario, it's like, well, what could that, what could the little person do to the big person? No sympathy for you. Right. Yeah. But if it you was know, the other way around, oh, oh my yeah, God, you're a, yeah, mon- absolutely. you're a monster. Or if you defend right. yourself, oh my God, you're a monster. We got to yeah. change that. We yeah. really got to change that because a lot of times, you know, we, we, we talk about in the family court battle, the gaslighting, getting yep. you to respond. It's the same thing with uh, domestic violence. They'll beat their crap out of you, hoping that the second you touch them, you become an abuser when you're just trying to defend yourself. Um, until you start speaking up, that's the narrative that we're going to have. Um, yeah. Don't be afraid to speak about what you're going through. And uh, I, I think we need more advocates talking about that. And Eric, Eric Godiva, if I'm saying that right, says, Eric is right. Speak up. You got to let the world know that violence against anyone of any gender is still violence, which is That's absolutely it. true. All right. Let me, you, uh, you ready to go to another, one more call? Let's do it, man. Uh, next caller. Hello and welcome to the show. Hi, Dwayne. Hi, Eric. Hey. Hello, how you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah, so I have a short question, you know, for you. So um, the thing is, like, you know, I, um, like, you know, work and earn good salary, right? But my ex doesn't, like, you know, earn anything, right? So it's been 15 years. She's making excuses, actually, um, that, you know, she'll start working. But, you know, she never works, right? So already being, like, you know, two years for separation, one year for separation agreement and like you know i filed a divorce like you know a few months back 
And in our separation document, I have it mentioned actually that, you know, she'll provide me a report and like, you know, start like, you know, working something. Um, I want to like, you know, have emotion against her, right? You know, why she is not working, right? Because I need to pay like, you know, a lot more spousal support to her. Right. But if you start working, right, it gets lesser. Um, but uh, my attorney says, okay, let the divorce go through. Like, it, it will be another, like, you know, month or so before it is, like, you know, finalized. And then, like, you know, we, so what is your guy's advice, right? Uh, I want to shed some light on her. Like, you know, whether I should pull a motion, how should I document, right? That, you know, that she, she has to be financially independent, but she doesn't work towards it. Okay. That's a great question. <laughs> it is a great question. You want to you wanna cover it first? I have my own thoughts. I- I mean, I've been through it too, man. Um, you know, uh, th- there's several different excuses that get used uh, from homeschooling to breastfeeding and different things about why they can't work. I think um, that comes in. Uh, I, I don't know if it's the same in every state. I think they'll calculate her uh, income as at least minimum wage. Um, but it's sad that one person can just completely get you for that and uh, doesn't have to have any responsibility on the other side. If, if, if I had any comments on it, it's going to be kind of in a, in a negative light. I, I know how that's making the caller feel right now. You got any advice on how you yeah, should no, document Yeah, no, what I would say on that is, is okay, first thing is going to depend on your location, right? So like, for instance, in California, uh, some areas in California recently changed this a couple of years back to where they, they expect both parties to actually work. Now, the problem is, like even in my situation, for me to have wages imputed, which is what Eric was talking about with them saying, you know, okay, well, you're not working, so we're going to pretend you make minimum wage, is, you know, I would have to go back to court and push that. So there's two parts to it that you have to look at. One is, you know, go ahead and, and, you know, pushing the button to get the numbers lowered so you can breathe. The second part is, is you really have to ask yourself, what is the, the ultimate cost it's going to cost you? And the reason I say that is because I've been in a situation where I could have done that. Actually, at one point, the Department of Child Support Services for my county said she needs to get a job ask us to reevaluate it and we will readjust it. And I haven't done it. And the reason I haven't done it is because every time I do something like that or hint towards it, the ex focuses her rage on the kids and it manifests itself in ways that I never expected. So in a lot of ways, I'm paying her extra to try to maintain some stability in the situation and I'm letting it run out because so that's what you have to look at it two ways. Cause you know, just on the front, I mean, like on the, on the, on the specific issue, depending on your location, you need to double check with your attorney, what legal, like in California, there's also a thing called like a Gavron warning where, and that was like, in my case, it's our, it, that was put in on day one. So there was already a warning basically saying, go, go get a, go get a damn job. But you have to see what, what's uh, acceptable and what's legal in your, in your state and your locale. And then is it ultimately worth it, right? If you look at the numbers, is what you would get back, and maybe the answer is yes, is it worth the risk and the cost of what it's going to cost you down the road? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So I'm in Canada, like, you know, Ontario. So here, right? Okay. Ooh, so yeah, support, different. yeah, imputing is kind of easier, right? Because they expect like everyone, but you know, they, they can't input anything to the child support actually that you need to have a judge in that. The yeah. problem for me is like, you know, I'm paying her 50% of the salary and seeing all yeah. the spousal support and child support, right? Nobody gives me a mortgage now. <laughs> so like, you know, that's why I was thinking, but uh, great advice guys. And thank you for doing that. Yeah. You know, for- that, that goes back to, we need to be taking care of the needs of the child. Um, why is it based on this much income? If, if X needs money, she needs to go to work. In my opinion, she needs to go to work. You, you definitely, that's your child. You can help with the expenses or we can get that equal shared parenting in there to yeah. get that going. But, um, you know, that's, that's my problem with the child support system right there. You're, you're well, saying that yeah. you got to support this person. You're there to support the child. So, you know, and I'll just tell you, man, I, I understand what a lot of people are going through with this. Cause I'll tell you, had, you know, I mentioned a minute ago that the child support, Department of Child Support Services said, hey, 
you know, they changed this. And I remember I actually called uh, Alex Falcone from the proper person. He pulled it up. He's like, holy crap. Yeah, California changed their, because before it was kind of like, you know, bettering yourself was, you know, if you were learning how to be a basket weaver, then that was enough to where I'd still pay. And they changed it. And he was like, holy crap, dude, they changed it. Yeah, it's shocking, especially in California. I know. I was I was completely <laughs> shocked. But um, I didn't, like I said, I mean, it's been four years since I found that out. And I never pushed the button on it. And I'm not planning on it. I'm planning on just writing this out until the last kid drops out. And then I'll probably have to do it for the alimony. But um, um, anyways, my point is, is had that, had the Department of Child Support Services said that to me like two years before, I was so angry that I would have burnt the house. I would have burnt everything. I would have burnt the state down for, to get 10 cents back. I mean, I was so angry. So you just got to, you got to pick your battles. You really have to just, you know, decide what is the best course of action. Sometimes it's going for it. I've talked to a lot of people who've gone for things, either a, a, a mom going for more child support because the ex isn't participating and it turns into a complete crap show because it turns into um, a nightmare. And they're like, oh my God, why did I do this? This was a stupid, I should have just shut up. I shouldn't have said anything, just stay, stuck with it. And I've seen the same thing from uh, men. I've, I've talked to men who, who pick a battle and they're like, oh my God, this is costing me tens of thousands of dollars and I don't really care about this fight. And I'm like, then why did you fight it? You know, you really Keep have to be careful. Yeah. 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 Anything you want to hit before we hit? I think the last caller, which I think is actually going to talk about back about John Mass. So, um, yeah. Do you, uh, do any other comment you want to hit before we, we take that caller? Yeah, I, I think know. it was caller before last. I'm sorry. You know, it's, it's, it's been a day, but, um, you know, he's talking about the in-laws and stuff, you know, keep in mind, uh, that's why this documentary will hit close to home with them. That was yeah. the father-in-law that did this to John. Yeah. So in-laws can definitely get in where they, they don't belong sometimes and definitely be a pain. I understand. I'd still encourage you to try to do everything you can to keep the peace and not respond to them. Yeah, but, copy uh, that. Okay. So let me go to the next caller. Hello and welcome to the show. Hi, Dwayne. Eric, this is uh wind forward here. How are you guys? Doing good. Win <laughs> forward. How are you doing? Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I'm doing, doing okay. Thanks for the extra long show today. I'm sure everyone appreciates it. Um, yeah, I wanted to relate to the, my call to John Mass, um, actually. Um, Eric, I, I listened to that show on uh, on Thanksgiving um, from a hotel room because I had had a restraining order against me. Um, and, and I couldn't believe when I heard that, that I'm going through exactly the same thing as John. Um I was accused of sexually molesting my three-year-old daughter in July. And after that, my nine-year-old son. Uh, both allegations were unfounded, but given the pandemic, instead of taking 60 days, it took over 100 days. Um, but, but listening to John and, and you speak, it, it just gave me some hope. So, oh my God, I'm not the only person in the world going through this. Um, and and so, you know, I don't specifically have a question, but I'll just give you a little bit of an update, if I may, um, and if you have any thoughts. So once BPS was done, got, I got the letters, um, and I went back to our lawyer, to my wife's lawyer, to say it's done. We should now have shared uh, parenting time. She refused that. She said CPS demanded that I have supervised visits, which actually they told me was not correct. So I had to file a motion. I had to file a motion which got heard, uh, which got submitted in February of this year. And as soon as I filed that motion, she had taken my children or our children to see a therapist and claimed that my daughter drew a drawing of me abusing <sighs> And I've got that so-called drawing. Um, and then she took that drawing to the police. And apparently now, you know, it, that this is February, remember, and I've got one or two criminal investigations pending against me. So we had the motion in March. And in, in March, the judge was leaning towards dad's been away from the kids too long. Dad needs to be reunited with the kids. She was leaning towards the right way until they said, well, he's got two criminal investigations pending. So the judge checked with the, 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 the police 
and apparently I do have a criminal investigation pending. Now it's September, and not one call from the police, nothing. Next week, on Tuesday, I've gone back to the court for a motion to reconsider, um, and it's going to be with the same judge. And basically, my lawyer said, you've taken away his constitutional rights. You know, he's had no due process. He's had these allegations. None of them are, none of them are true. Um, he needs to be reunited with his, with, with, with his children. And so, it, it, you know, I, I just wanted to call in today because this, this is about John. I relate to it very much and what everyone else is, is going through. Um, I, I don't have a question other than bless you, bless you both. I've written, like John, I have over 150 letters to my kids. They're all saved. They're not talking about the situation. They're just talking about the day I've had, how they're doing, the first day at school, Christmas, Easter, Halloween, etc. I've been completely shut out of the school, but I have slowly now got back into the neighborhood community. Fortunately, I have a little bit of money, so I'm now able to rent a nice place. I'm literally 20 minutes away. The one important thing I do want to share with you, um, Eric, you talked about speaking up. So I fought back on the restraining order when, when that was filed back in end of July. And I filed a counter-restraining order based on my lawyer's advice. And the judge shouldn't have given me a restraining order because she had no evidence against me. But I fortunately had evidence against her. I had video recordings of our ring doorbell that I saved that her literally throwing me out of the house, throwing my clothes out of the house. So that was a straight saving grace in my case, at least up until now is that we have restraining orders against each other. It doesn't help me with the kids, but it may help me as we progress through our divorce. Um, that, that's all I wanted to say. Again, bless you both. Bless everyone that's going through this. To me, it's not about winning or losing. It's not about mum or dad. It's about the children. And, and I've put posters up on my wall to motivate me every day. It's about the children. I adore them. They adore me. And I will get to them. I'm literally 20 minutes away. And I will get to them sooner or later. You will. That's all I wanted to say. Bless you guys. Thanks. Oh, one, sorry, Eric. One last thing for you specifically. I, I listened to your uh, show with the guy in New Jersey. I'm in New Jersey. If you do come here or New York, I'm not on Facebook, but please post it on, on YouTube. I will stand with you if you come here. I will be right by your side. Thank We've you, been man. there twice this year. I'll let you know, though. I definitely will. And, uh, you know, man, no, you're not Please alone. I'd, I'd say these false allegations, um, they were way more common than I than I expected. Um, in a lot of these alienation cases, I say there's, there's more of the alienation cases, in my experience, that I've heard of that have the silver bullet attached to it than ones that don't. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, you know, and we've got, again, to, to start talking out about this. It's, uh, it's one of those things that keeps people's voices from speaking up, um, because of yeah. that stigma and everything that's yeah. going on. But Garza, Garza that I was talking about, you know, he's been through 43 false CPS allegations, beat every single one. Uh, he was, yeah. he was sitting here listening yeah. to you as you was speaking. He would like to, uh, speak with you. Um, about that situation, said he knows some some tactics that he would like to run by. Oh, I'd, so, I'd love to do that. Yeah, yeah. I'll reach out. I'll reach out to you, Eric, on if that's okay, and I'll connect okay. with him. That would be wonderful. Sounds yeah, that, good. That would be great. All right. So, yeah. Thank Thank you, guys. Keep doing what you're doing. I know. I know it's hard. You know, one thing I've found is I'm I'm now helping other mums and dads in New Jersey. Who are going through similar type of things, um, but thanks again. Bless you, bless you guys. Thank you, man. Hold on, I'm just hitting my buttons. I, you know, the one thing I would say, I mean, I, 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 I know, I know, John's case ended horrifically, but I think one thing to to say is he was able to 
fight false allegations and move aways and all that stuff. And if you can persevere and it's, I went forward was in a way he said it, it's like he, I think he, he believes he's ultimately going to prevail. You just have to go through this freaking nightmare and these allegations and, and stuff. It's just, but, but stick you with know, it. Right. You know, the, the hard thing about this is cause I know how bad the system is guys. We've talked about it several times tonight. So I'd usually, I try my best to, to, to go in any other direction besides telling you to go there. Um, to be honest with you, but in the cases of false allegations, you're going to need a good attorney. You're going to yep. need a good oh, yeah. attorney yeah. that's well versed in this. And, um, you know, it, it, I'd say like the John Mass case, Kevin Hickey, um, the one that I was talking about that I do the show with every other week. John went through this for three years and he had an attorney on it. Kevin got in on the last three months. And in those three months, uh, you know, John was exonerated. Uh, you need someone that is very well experienced in the silver bullet cases. And uh, I know they cost money. I, I know they do. I know a lot of you are not um, in the position where you can pay, but find 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 one that you believe in that's not going to rip a hole in you that you know is going to do what needs to be done because these cases are nightmares. They are nightmares and they can get dragged on and on. And there can be several different allegations. If you beat this one, here comes another one. Uh, holidays are a common time where yeah. uh, these these parents are supposed to be going and pick up their kids from school for the holidays, get hit with a temporary restraining order. Yep. And uh, these things can get thrown away left and right. Uh, I think you had somebody that was asking about, uh, has there been any legislation on a federal level against false allegations? That I know of, No. Um, are they open to it? Yes, I have talked to lots of them, but that goes back to talking to you guys and why your voice is so important. Uh, these guys are paying attention and they're speaking up about it. What do they need to see? You saying that if they speak on it, uh, you're going to vote for them. You're going to support yep. for them because that's what it takes. If we've got issues, uh, if we don't have the the voters and the support behind it, they can speak about it all they want. But if they're not in office, it does us no good. So they want to see us as a movement saying, hey, we're going to back you. Right. And yeah. uh, when we when we start to form and strategize like that, that's when I think you're going to see this thing take off like a rocket ship. Yep. Man. OK, so that was all the callers. Uh Eric, would do anything? Uh, let's see. We've already talked about your links. I'll put links in the description. But where can yeah. people where can people find you? And then, uh, you know, fa Facebook, Facebook, and uh, you know, I'm really trying to get this going over on YouTube. YouTube's been a little bit of a different animal for me. Um, <laughs> we grew very quickly on Facebook, and uh, YouTube is really starting to to pick up. We've been getting a, a lot more new viewers and stuff in there, but. Uh, this is only going to be released, this documentary, on YouTube. It's 100% free. Uh, one of the reasons is Facebook won't allow a file this size. It was, a, it was a pretty big file going into there. But I think if you will watch it, um, it will definitely touch your heart. It's not the easiest thing yeah. to watch through. Uh, there's going to be some there's, – there's a hole at the end. I know everybody wants to know about mom and different stuff. There's some of that. Um, you know, We're going to have to wait a little bit of time for, but – John's story needs to be told. He was a father that did everything the right way. Yep. He fought for those kids. And um, standing over him, guys, it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. You doubt, you know, Dwayne, I'm sure you've had this before when doing these channels and talking to these parents, even though we, we you know, we hear how we're changing people's lives. Sometimes you second guess the impact that you're having in people's lives. Um, yeah. and it is what I'm doing matters. Is it, is it really, you know, making a difference and it's standing over somebody like John, you know, who was fighting so hard. This was life and death for him. Yeah. That story that getting that out, um, had we not done that, John's voice might not have ever been heard. Um, so this is his legacy and now we are his voice. Um, we are the ones that are left behind to make sure that there's justice for this situation. And this, the sad thing is, uh, there's so many more stories. There was a father that got shot at a custody exchange the week after John got killed. Um, but this one was yeah. close to home with me. And uh, we put everything we had into this. Uh, we didn't leave anything on the table. So if you guys could share it, like it, watch it, um, it, it would mean a lot. 
So uh, Facebook, right. again, YouTube, Instagram, those are basically where we're the most active. DadTalkToday.com. I'm trying to get a little bit of work done to that. But um, if you need to reach out to me, that'd be a good place to, to go to. All right. And on that... Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. I appreciate your time, and I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Eric. Make sure that you do go and sign up and uh, follow that that uh, documentary when it's released on uh, Sunday. I also want to say thank you to all the channel members. Thank you so much for support and helping keep the lights on. Don't let this crap get you down, and don't let them destroy your lives, guys. <laughs>